Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall and I invite you to join me as we journey through a forbidding landscape, peopled with the most demoniacal furies in or out of this world. There is that moment, that imperceptible, unmarked, uncertain moment, when we pass from day to night, and from life to death. And try as we may, we can never isolate that moment. We can never grasp it, hold it, keep it. And somewhere during that moment, only the length of the shortest fraction of a second, the living are separated from the dead. And yet, it might just as well be as long as all eternity. Who are you? You know who I am. I'm Bert. You can't be. Don't fight it. But Bert is dead. That's right. I'm dead. Then how can you be standing here talking to me? I don't know. I'm here, that's all. What do you want? I want my wife. She's my wife. But first, she had taken a vow to be mine. I know that vow. It says, till death do us part. You're dead. You're parted. I've come for her. I won't let you take her. How can you stop me? I'll kill you. How can you kill me? I'm dead. Our mystery drama, Love Me and Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ann Shepard and Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you say but, you said a lot of things nobody else can say. When you say but, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. You've said the world that means you like to do it all. When you say what, you say you care and 
Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. This is Arnold Palmer. In golf, we call someone who plays exceptionally well a champ. And a champ works to win. His whole way of life is geared to that talent. That ability in him which makes him win. Well, that's one way of living. But there are others. And the March of Dimes offers us some of those ways. Ways to work to prevent birth defects. Or ways to help kids born with birth defects. For many of those kids, a way of life is a difficult direction to discover. But for most of us, it's not. By us, I mean young people, middle-aged people, senior citizens, everyone. As honorary national chairman for the March of Dimes, I can tell you that the greatest gift you can give any handicapped child is a little understanding, a little encouragement, and a chance to appreciate life. Won't you help Join the March of Dimes today and find a way of life. The most important decisions of our lives are usually not based upon careful reasoned study or even on common sense. No, our most vital decisions are often arrived at suddenly, irrationally. Men and women choose each other because of a mysterious music in the voice or a sparkle in the eye. You remember the saying, had the nose of the beautiful Helen of Troy sloped outward instead of inward, there never would have been a Trojan War. So, Stephen Barrow wanted Emily Phillips for the same reason Paris wanted Helen. She was the most beautiful woman he ever saw. These things... Never change. Happy, darling? Yes. It doesn't sound very enthusiastic. I'm sorry. Sorry? What a word to use on a wedding night. Well, I mean... But I mean... I'm so afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? I'm so afraid this is all a dream. Oh, no. No, dear, it's real enough. Oh, Steve, I want to be happy, darling. And you will be, Emma. You and I, we are going to be the two happiest people in all the world. Do you mean that, Steve? Of course I mean it. Now, what, what's troubling you? Bert. Say What? I'm thinking of Bert. I shouldn't be, I know, but I was married to Bert once. Yes, dear, you were. You were. Bert is dead. He's gone forgotten. Why do you listen to me? What kind of talk is this on our honeymoon? Steve, you really are so wonderful. Oh, of course I am. And you'll just have to put up with me sometimes when I get into these moods. Now, you're not going to have time for moods. We spend the night here at the motel, tomorrow the plane for New York, three days in the big town, and then we fly to London. Is it true? Are we really going? Why do you keep asking if these things are true? Because I find it so hard to believe that good things are going to happen to me at last. Only good things from now on. Oh, I love you. I love you so much. Let me tell you why you're going to have a deliriously happy married life. Why? Because you're one woman in a million. Oh. You're not actually of this world. Oh, come on. That isn't true. You're so... You're so... What is the word? You're so ethereal. Yeah, yeah, that's probably the word. And you're so fragile, just like, just like the delicate and beautiful things that you write poetry about. When's the last time I told you you were wonderful? Oh, about 45 seconds ago. Oh, darling. I feel now that I can write again. I know I can write again. Hey, where are you going? I want to look out the window. It's as if I just saw the moon and the stars for the very first time. Well, no. Let me tell you something, dearest. Every time you see the moon, the stars, the sun, the sky, it should be as if it were for the first time. Each time there should always be the thrill of discovery. This, this feeling is how I know I can write again. I 
great. It's gone. All the misery, the suffering, everything I knew with birth. It's cruelty, it's violence. Yes, he'll never be able to hit me again. No, Emily, he's gone. Finally. I'm free. I... What's wrong, Emily? What is it? Steve, look out the window. At what? There, near the swimming pool. All right, I'm looking. There, this man. Where? There, that man standing there. Darling, there isn't anyone standing. He's looking up this way. I don't see anyone. He's looking up at our window. Oh, it has to be your imagination. No, 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 Steve. This man. No, darling, it's just a shadow cast by the edge. What? See? He's moving his hand. I tell you, there's no he's, one there. He's beckoning for me, for me to come. Darling, 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 it's only your imagination. Now, come away from the window. Uh, I can't move. Emily, there's no one out there. There's no one at all. Come with me, and I'll prove it. No. I won't go to him. He'll take me away. Emily, darling, get hold of you. Oh, look at him. He's so much bigger than you are. Where are you going? Uh, Don't take your arms away. I only want to pick up the telephone. Why? I have to prove something to you, darling. <laughs> Nobody's there. Oh, Steve. Hello, desk. Yeah, uh, look, this is Mr. Barrow in room 118. Listen, the swimming pool and the patio area, it has floodlights, those big lights. Steve, he's yeah. coming closer. Yeah, could you, could you turn them on, please? Now, I, I know what time it is. This is an emergency. Uh, look, just don't ask questions. Do it, please. <laughs> Emily, look, the lights. Thanks very much. You see? You see that? It's light it's all around the patio and the pool. Now, where is that man? The man that you thought you saw. Hmm? Where? Uh, it's all lit up. It's as bright as day. There's nobody there. It's deserted, isn't it? Yes. So, it was all just your imagination. But I saw it. It was like I said, a shadow. And then the lights came on. And it disappeared. Yes. He, he disappeared. But just before he did, I saw his face. It was Bert. It, it couldn't be. Darling, I saw him. Darling, Bert is dead. I saw him. It was Bert. With that wide-brimmed floppy hat of his. The khaki trench coat. The boots. Emily. Cowboy boots. And, and you, you didn't see... No, dear. How could you miss him? You're going to see Dr. Rossman. Oh, what good will he do? Look, if it was your imagination, then we have a problem. But if Bert was actually there, then Rossman may have a problem. After all, it was Dr. Rossman who pronounced him dead. You sure you saw Bert? How could I not see him, a man of his size? Yet... Steve saw no one. No one. And then, when the pool and patio were flooded with light, suddenly he disappeared. But in that instant, you saw his face. And it was Bert. No, it wasn't. Because Bert is in his grave. But I tell you, I saw him. Emily, you have a guilty conscience about Bert. Guilty? Why? Because he's dead and you're alive. But I told you how he treated me. Yes, but you keep thinking. Perhaps. Perhaps it was your fault. Perhaps if you'd been more patient, more understanding. Yes, perhaps. And now, once again, you are married. And on your wedding night, you fear that Bert still feels that he's the bridegroom. And that's why he beckons you to come to him. Doctor, what can I do? Place your trust in Steve. Oh, I do trust. Your full trust. Don't be afraid that this marriage will also fail. Steve loves you. He wants to protect you. Do you believe it? Yes. I believe it. If you really believe it, you don't have to be afraid of Bert anymore. I'm not afraid. I'm no longer afraid of Bert. Go on your honeymoon. Be happy with Steve. And you will never see Bert again. How did it go? Dr. Rossman was just wonderful. 
Really? I suppose it's because he told me all the things I already knew myself. But deep down... Such as? Oh, it's all mixed up, but I think I understand it. Darling, let's order lunch. If you can dismiss it that easily, great. I was silly last night. Yeah. You were also very scared. Well, it was real enough. But it was an illusion. And now we both must forget it ever happened. I've already forgotten. Did you cancel the flight to New York? No, not yet. Just not waste time here. We can eat at the airport. You mean you feel well enough to go on a trip? It's over. All the fear, all the worry. Our bags are packed. We just have to check out. New York, London, Paris, Rome. Here we come. You folks checking out? I hope you found the service satisfactory. Oh, everything was fine. Just great. Name, please. Uh, what did you say the name was again? Barrow. Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Barrow. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That'd be under the B, see. Here we are. Oh, oh, I got something for you. Sure, would be mighty glad to see it. What is it? We well, found it for you. Yes, sir, we did. You found what? I didn't you party that called death middle of the night and wanted the light turned up around the pool? Yeah, but, uh... We what? turned them on. Uh-huh. Said we figured you must have lost something out there and wanted to find it, right? No, the reason we wanted... So we turned on the lights, but I guess it didn't help any. Well, as it turned out, it did. So when the maintenance fellows come on this morning, we asked them to take a sharp look. And... Hey, thank you for you. About what? It's coupling. About what coupling? Well, you're a coupling. No wonder you're so concerned. That's made out of solid gold. That's not my coupling. Right there, plan of day. It's your initial, Mr. Barrow. A big, bold B. Well, there must be some mistake. Well, how could there be a mistake? Steve, let me see the cufflinks. Emily, it isn't mine. Steve, let me see. Oh. This... Emily, what's wrong? This belonged... It was Bert's cufflink. I gave it to Bert for a wedding present. Steve, he was here. Bert was here. It's all very well for the doctor to say it's Emily's imagination, which is being fired by things like guilt and remorse and fear. Sure, we can all say that. But how about that gold cufflink with Bert's initial on it? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. If you're on the verge of buying a new small car, buy a small Buick. Not just because I say so, but because of what I'm about to tell you. The three small Buicks, Skyhawk, Skylark, and Apollo, are newly designed for 1975. Their styling is fresh. Their engineering is up to date. Each of these small Buicks is powered by a spirited new V6 engine that delivers excellent gas mileage. Each of these small Buicks has steel-belted radial tires. They each have a high-energy ignition system, Spark plugs that last nearly four times longer than before. And, of course, they each have typically comfortable Buick interiors. There's one other reason for choosing a small Buick. If you take delivery of a new Skyhawk by February 28, 1975, Buick will send you a check for $500. If you take delivery of a Skylark or an Apollo by February 28, Buick will send you $200. So if you're going to buy a small car, buy a small Buick at your Buick dealer. What's that, an old phonograph record? Yep, from way back in the 40s. You'd never guess what it is. Give me a hint. Well, it's soft music. Here comes Peter Cottontail. No, listen. Culligan. Soft water server. Culligan. Brings it right to your home. Women everywhere are raving about the soap and money they're saving with Culligan. Soft water server. C-U-L-L-L-I-G-A-N. Culligan. And it spelled out the whole story, except how to call the Culligan man. Like this? Hey, C-U-L-L-I-G-A-N man. Hey, who? All right. Hey, Culligan man. I like that part, though. The C-U-L-L-I-G-A-N part? Yes, it's pretty close to spell over you. With Culligan's economical rental plan, you can enjoy the benefits of softened water for only a small monthly charge, the same way you pay for your telephone or electricity. Call your Culligan man to rent a Culligan for as little as $5.50 a month. From 
From a philosophical point of view, one may express many attitudes toward death. But from a practical perspective, it is difficult, if not impossible, to deny that death is, at the very least, final. The soul may live on forever, but on one thing there has to be universal agreement. The body is gone. Well, last night, Emily Barrow saw her former husband, Bert Phillips. And Bert has been dead for over three years. A ghost? Do ghosts wear gold cufflinks? Emily, dear, maybe maybe we better not check out just Oh, yet. no, no, no. I want to leave here right away. The state that you're in. He's here. I know. Bert's here. We've got to leave. Yeah. Yes, dear, of course. Now, let's, let's just sit down for a minute. Quietly. All right, that's it. Now relax. Let's be calm. You say that this is Bert's cufflink. How, how can you be sure? Steve, I know. I know. The store that sold it to you could have had dozens. I didn't buy it in a Well, store. the jeweler could have made others, and there could have been someone with the initial B. Steve, I'm terrified. Darling, there's nothing that should make you as frightened as you are now. The cufflink. I made it myself. You what? I was taking a course in jewelry making. I'd always expressed myself in words. I wanted to see if I could achieve all right, meaning. All right, in... all right, I believe you. I believe you. Now, let's look for the rational explanation. This cuffling and the mate to it are the only ones of its kind in the I world. Will, I will fight you, dear. You made it. You recognize it. It belonged to Bird. I still say that there is a rational explanation. No, not for me. Yes. And you must listen to me. Now, when is the last time that you saw this cufflink? Three years ago. You haven't seen it in three years? No. So, what we must assume is that there was a burglary. The links were stolen. No. The thief may have sold them, and by a coincidence, the new owner had stopped at this very hotel. No, Steve. I remember. I remember you told me that your apartment had been broken into a few years ago. Now, why wouldn't the thief have taken the cufflinks? Because they weren't in the apartment. Where were they? I buried them with Bert. You, you you buried them with Bert? Why? Because they were his. They belonged to him. And he loved them. Bert was here. Emily, you must get hold of yourself. He said he'd come back for me. Who said what? Bert. He said my place was with him. Forever. He said he'd come back for me. And he's cruel enough to drag me away. I'm taking you to the doctor. I've seen the doctor. Now, what do you want to do? Maybe it's this place. Maybe there's something about this motel. How could there be? Let's get out of here. Oh, darling, please. We can still make the plane to New York. <laughs> How much time do we have? Plenty of time to finish your cough. Feeling better? Mm hmm much. It must have been the motel. I remember now, I once spent a night there with Bert. The place has been remodeled. It has a new name. place can be haunted. Sometimes by a memory. I think this whole town is haunted for me. It's where Bert and I spent most of our marriage. Oh, you look so much better now. I feel so much better. I must have worried you horribly last night. Yes. Well... It should teach you a lesson. Don't ever fall in love with a girl at first sight and marry her two weeks later without knowing anything about her. I know everything I need to know. How do you predict these things, anyhow? I had a friend who married the girl next door. They knew everything about each other. The marriage lasted six months. Transnational Airlines, flight number Where's one it? for New York. Uh, uh, that's Airport. us, flight now number one in New York. Let's go. Yeah. At gate huh. 16. Your attention, please. Will Mrs. Bert Phillips please report to the airline service desk in the main lobby? Mrs. Bert Phillips. Mrs. Hmm? Bert Phillips. That's me. No, you are not Mrs. Bert Phillips. You are Mrs. Steve Barrow. That's how he would page me. He's here. Oh, no, darling. You said you'd believe me. And I do, but there can be another Mrs. Bert Phillips. He's paging me. Darling, look, if you claim to see him, that's one thing. And I'll cross that bridge with you when we get there. But you simply can't jump at every sound. Now, wait here a minute. 
but... Now, but, but nothing, but nothing. Here, at this phone booth. Why? Why are we... Now, I, I want to help you. Emily, pick up that directory. Come on, come on, come on. Right. Open it, open it. All uh-huh. right, find the name Phillips. Hmm. Phillips. Phillips. All right, now, under B. Look, 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 he wasn't the only Bert Phillips. See, there are three Bert Phillips, hmm. two Bertrams, and four, six B Phillips. Yeah. Some of them could be Bert's also. You see what I mean? I think so. Now, come on, we'll miss that plane. Okay. This is Bert Phillips. Please report to oh. service desk. Please. That is not you. Two hours hmm. from now, we'll be in New York. Things will be different. All right, here we are. Gate six. Guess we'll have to stand online and have our tickets checked. Why, why, why don't you sit down? I'll take care of it. Sure. Over there. By the gate. A very tall man. Where? See? No, I don't see. There, Steve. He's pointing to me. He's motioning me to come to Emily. Just the way he did last night. Emily. I won't go. Emily. I've got to get away from him. Emily. Emily, come back. No. Emily. No. Emily, stop. 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 Emily. Stop for a minute. No, you take me away. I won't let him. You can't stop him. Look out for the door. No, Emily, look out. Emily, where are we going? That's me. That's me. Get in quickly. Hurry. Slam the door. Driver, get away from here. As fast as you can, please. Maybe he's your fleet now. Dr. Rossman, what what am I going to do about it? I wish I could tell you. Isn't there any treatment, any medicine? It all adds up to time, patience, luck. And if this delusion continues... I would suggest she be placed in the sanitarium. Why? Because she'll be unable to function in normal surroundings. Why, why, why do you call it a delusion? What else can I call it? Well, suppose, suppose it's true. Suppose she really did see him. No, Steve, don't. It isn't good for you to think that way, and it won't help her. But, but just suppose she did. Now, Steve, that's impossible. Well, you know, you, you doctors, you think you know everything. We don't. We know very little. And that very little has to go a long, long way. But what we know, we know. I'm sorry. It's all right. Listen, this, this Bert, you, you know him. What, what kind of a guy was he? She never told me very much about him, except that he, he treated her terribly. I never met him. You never? I thought that you had known him all. Emily came to see me about a year or so ago, quite distressed. She said she was having trouble with him. She said he would even beat her. What she needed was to build up enough nerve to leave him. I only happened to mention that you were the doctor who pronounced him dead. Isn't that unusual for a psychiatrist? Yes, but I was the doctor at the scene. What was the scene? Haven't you ever asked Emily? Yes, but she, she can't talk about it. They owned a cabin on Indian Mountain. Bert was a writer on hunting, fishing, you know. A wild country. The back of their property led to a cliff, a drop of a couple of hundred feet. She was out there one morning, doing some watercolors. He was drunk. They got into an argument. He started towards her, and somehow he lost his footing and fell. Well, now, why would you be called? She went to pieces. All she could think of was to telephone me. I came, and I did what I could. He he was, was killed, wasn't he? Instantly. It's a sheer drop right onto the rocks. Well, <clears throat> call me in the morning. Yeah. And remember, if this persists, you'll have to think about a definite course of action. Good night. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. See? Darling, you should, should be trying to get some sleep. Where are we? We're at a hotel. What happened? We were well, at the airport. I remember. And you thought that you saw Bert. I did see Bert. And you became panicky and you ran away and I, I took you to this hotel and called Dr. Rossman. Oh. And he gave you a shot. He doesn't believe I saw Bert. That's right. Neither do you. Darling. Last night you said you could understand me. 
I need that understanding right now. Emily, you must be calm. I don't need someone to tell me to be calm, to relax. I need someone who believes in me. I believe in you. You believe what I tell you. I saw Bert, even though you won't find a shred of evidence. A single cold, hard fact to support me. You must believe me only because you love me. You must believe me because I ask you to believe me. I would believe you. Emily. Do you? Do you believe me? <sighs> yes, darling. Oh. Yes, I believe you. Suddenly I feel so sleepy. It's as if a great weight had just been lifted off my shoulders. As if I'd been awakened from some terrible nightmares. I'm not afraid to go back to sleep, Steve. It's been such a hectic day for you, too. Won't you get to bed? Yeah. I, I just want to sit here for a minute. I'm very tired. I'm almost too tired to get up. Uh, let me open the window. Don't stay up too late. I won't. I won't. Emily, there's something... There's one thing that bothers me. Emily? Well, never mind. We can talk about that in the morning. What? Who? Who, who is it? Who is it? Just, just a minute. Ned? Yes? Good evening, Steve. Who, who are you? You know who I am. I'm Bert. It was Dr. Rothman who officially pronounced Bert dead. So, what's this? The good doctor has an entire array of medical and scientific fact to confirm his findings. Stephen Barrow has only the testimony of his eyes and ears. In the final analysis, you, of course, will have to decide. And I shall present additional evidence for both sides when I return shortly with Act Three. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. But give your coin to contact. The good is better. Sneezing, grips, congestion. What next? Six or three or one. Is that an answer or a question? That's the question, when you catch the common cold. For you, the answer is 12-hour contact. Why? Well, because you'd need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three cold pills, one every four hours, or just one contact capsule for up to 12 hours continuous relief of your sneezing, drips, and congestion. The tiny time pills do it. For aches and fever, the others contain aspirin. And contact doesn't. Right. So, six or three or one. Your cold, your choice. I'll take the one contact, thank you. Give your cold, to contact, the two the Six or three or one. Take contact only as directed. Save a little and save a lot more at the Northwest Federal General Store. That's where you'll find a giant cracker barrel of gifts. Gifts for savers by famous makers we all know. The Sunbeam Hand Mixer, the Schick Style Dryer, a Presto Pressure Cooker and Wearing Blender. And they're all free or priced for special savings when you save $250 or more. See them all in our newspaper ads. And now you can save at three centers of interest in the great Northwest Territory, on Irving Park Road, on Dempster Street in Des Plaines, and now in Norwich in the Harlem Irving Plaza. So save where you get the highest interest rates allowed by law. And get free gifts, too, from the Cracker Barrel of Gifts, now at Northwest Federal Savings. But come in soon. Some styles and colors are limited. One gift per family, please. Offer good for a limited time only. Remember, it's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. Ladies and gentlemen, you're tuned in on Chicago. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. The correct time, 11.04. It is 31 degrees at Midway. It'll be a little bit colder tonight, says Weather Command. There are those who say that death is the end. And those who say that death is the beginning. Now, however, it seems that we are being faced with death as a continuation. Bert Phillips was killed in an accident. 
a fall from a cliff. He was properly and officially buried. But here he seems to be standing at the door of the hotel room where his former wife is spending the night with her new husband. Up to now, it was only Emily, frightened and troubled Emily, who had been able to see Bert. But now, is it Steve's turn? Steve sees Bert, sees him plainly, as he stands in the doorway. Who, who are you? I told you. Bert. You can't be. You're dead. I'm dead. Well, how can you be standing here talking to me? I don't know. It's enough for me that I'm here. What do you want? I want to talk to you. May I come in? It's a, it's a dream. That's what it is. It's a dream. It may not be. You admit you're dead. What are you doing here? You sent for me. I sent for you. What are you talking about? You'll have to figure that out for yourself. Why would I send for you? There's an idea forming in the back of your mind. You're not aware of it consciously. You're going to resist it, but it's the truth. I still don't know what you want. I want my wife. She's my wife. She had taken a vow to be mine. That vow says, till death do us part. You're dead. You're parted. That's just a technicality. But if you're dead, why do you want Emily? She belongs with me. If you're dead and she's alive, how can you be together? She won't be alive when I take her. What do you mean? I'll have to kill her. Kill her? Why not? She killed me. Yeah, but you, you, you died in an accident. Ah, it's her story. What actually happened was that I was standing at the edge of the cliff taking photographs for an article I was writing, and she just pushed me over. I don't believe it. You better believe it. Because one day, a year or two from now, she'll have to kill you, too. Oh, this is a dream. I need your help. Why should I help you? In the long run, I'll be saving your life. You have to convince her to come to the cabin... It's the only place from where I can take her. That's where she killed me. You can't be serious. Think about what I told you. Keep asking yourself, why do you see me? You might get the answer if you first ask yourself, why did she see me? Or, better yet, ask her. Darling, did you fall asleep in that chair? Oh, I guess... I guess I did. I feel so guilty. I had such a wonderful, refreshing sleep. So deep, so restful. Was he... Did I dream? What are you muttering about? You said that Bert always wore a big... kind of big floppy hat and a trench coat and, a, and, and cowboy boots. Uh, Darling, the absolutely last person in this whole world I want to talk about is Bert. Yeah. Listen. Uh, Bert Phillips, as far as I'm concerned, has never existed. Emily, tell me something. Why do you think... You see? Nothing. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm starved. Darling, you all right? Sure. I, I just had a crazy dream, that's all. Steve, you sure you're all right? Yeah, I'm okay. What? You haven't touched the thing. Oh, I never eat much breakfast. The important thing is that you feel okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have this terrible confusion, and then suddenly it's gone. Why it came, you'll never know. How it went, you'll never find out. It's as if someone... Magically took it away. But it's gone, and that's all that matters. And now, darling, are we ready to resume our honeymoon? Sure. But we'll have to make some new reservations. Tell you what. Let's not go to New York and then on to Europe. No, why not? Well, we've postponed it twice already. Maybe it's a sign that, deep down, we didn't want to go so far away in the first place. How about Mexico City? Just a few hours away, and we can... Steve? Are you really all right? 
Emily. Do you see someone standing by the door? Where? Just to the, the left of the cashier's desk. No, darling, there's nobody standing. It must have been my imagination. Oh, Steve. You caught it for me, this delusion of seeing people. What did it look like? Uh, I'm not even sure I saw anyone. Mexico City. How about it? Yeah, it sounds great. My problem is I don't have a thing to wear for Mexico. Neither do you. Well, let's go somewhere else. No, let's go shopping. I'll meet you back here at the hotel for dinner, and we can make reservations for the morning. Are, are you sure that you're up to going by yourself? Darling, I always shop by myself, and certainly never with a man. Well, but do you feel well enough? When I think of how silly I was over that whole birth business. Well, I've got to get started. See you at dinner, darling. <laughs> I picked up a few things. I'm spending a lot of money. Well, that's all right. What are you doing? I thought I'd take a nap. That's good, darling. You do that. I'll see you in a little while. Bye. Why didn't I ask her? Why? Why? You left your door open. Bad. You should keep the door locked these days. What do you want? You didn't ask her. Ask her what? You know what? Were you at the cashier's desk in the coffee shop at breakfast time? You know I was. This is a dream. Dream or reality, what does it matter? You're stuck with me because you believe her. You want to believe her. You love her. This is getting us nowhere. I love her, too. I'm a bigger chump than you are. Even after what she did to me, I love her. And why did you treat her so badly? Who says I treated her badly? Everybody. Who's everybody? Dr. Rossman, for one. He never said I mistreated her. He said she told him I abused her. But you did. Only because she says so. Why should she kill you? For the same reason she'll kill you. You keep saying that. Why do you refuse to believe it? It's true. You can't prove it. Oh, but I can. The camera will prove it. What camera? I told you I was out there taking pictures. She sneaked up behind me and pushed me over the cliff. Her story, she was painting pictures and I was drunk, started beating her, and somehow lost my balance. Why shouldn't I believe her? Because she lied. She made her way down the mountain to where I was lying dead, poured liquor all over me. But she'd forgotten about the camera. The camera? The camera. I was so intent on taking my pictures... That's why I didn't hear her. But the camera went over the cliff with me. It broke against the rocks. It came to rest, finally, behind some bushes. I believe Emily. Oh, your place I would, too. But the camera, all smashed up, has been lying there three years now, in snow, in mud, summer and winter. It's still there. Or what's left of it is still there. Not 20 feet from where I landed. I said I don't believe you. She forgot about it or didn't think about it. In a court of law, that wouldn't prove a thing. That camera could have fallen there at any time. It's not supposed to prove anything in a court of law. It's supposed to prove something to you. What do you want me to do? Bring her to the cabin. To the cliff. I want her. You think I'm crazy? Crazy or sane, it doesn't matter to me. Bring her. Let me have her. No. She'll kill you. you. Keep on saying she'll kill me. Why? Okay. Okay. Ask me the question you're afraid to ask her. Why do you think she saw me? Be because, because she has a guilty conscience. She feels guilty because she's happy with me. Does she? Now let's examine that. She feels guilty because she's happy with you. She's so happy with you that on her wedding night, she sees me. Shouldn't that prove something? What could it prove? She's sorry. Not because she killed me, but because she killed me and wound up with you. She loves me. No, she likes you. Why not? You're a nice guy. Most girls like you. But love? <laughs> That's something else. You're not exciting for Emily the way I was. You're not wild enough for her the way I was. 
That's why she saw me, Steve. She wants me. That's a lie. You can't face it. That's why you didn't ask her. Ask her what? Why she saw me on your wedding night. I'll kill you. I'm already dead. Why do you insist she killed you? Because I was wise to her. You'll also get wise to her one day. Bring her up to the cabin. Never. Scared? Why should I be scared? Once she's up there, she'll have to choose between us. And you're scared she'll choose me. Why do you want to go to the cabin? I have to do something. I don't understand. What is there you'd have to do at the cabin? It concerns Bert. Bert? Suppose you see him again. I don't want to go to the cabin. You've got to. We have to get rid of Bert. But I am rid of him. He may be gone, he may not. But if you can face that cabin and that cliff, then you will destroy him for good. I haven't been here since he died. You never told me how it happened. I was never able to talk about it. Can you talk about it now? I was painting. My easel was set up here. Right near the edge of the cliff. It's a spectacular view, isn't it? Yes. Careful. Don't stand too close to that edge. He was drunk. More than usual. Ugly, bad tempered. He criticized my work. I paid no attention. And that infuriated him. He lunged at me and I was terrified. I stepped aside. He stumbled and just fell over. It was awful. Did, did, you, did you love him? Oh, no. How could I love him? He was a beast. Well, then why did you see him on our honeymoon? I didn't really see him. It was only my imagination. Why should you even see him in your imagination? Why should there have been room in your mind, your heart, for anyone but me? Wasn't I enough for you? You were. You are. Or did you want him? Do you still want him? He did. He was there at the hotel. I saw him. You saw him? You wanted me to see him. You made it a test of my love. And so because I love you, I saw him. And that's why I brought you here. So that you can choose between us. Between who? Between Bert and me. How can I? Bert's dead. Is that the only reason? Let go of me. Is it? Steve. Did you kill Bert? No. Tell the truth. No. <laughs> Did you kill him? Yes. Why? Because he laughed at me. At my work. At my poetry. At my painting. He said they're a joke. Oh, they're not. They're exquisite. He was right. I'm a phony. Oh, no, you're wonderful. No, I'm not. I'm a phony. I'm not wonderful. Nothing about me is wonderful. But was right. He said, you're a phony. A poet who never writes poetry. A painter who never paints a picture. Even the cufflinks. Bird made those cufflinks. He knew what I was. He loved me for what I was, and I loved him. But sometimes I got mad enough to kill him. And one day I did. Oh, Emily, Emily, listen. Emily, whatever you have done, I love you. I don't want you. I want Bert. I need a man like Bert. Emily, you can't mean any of this. Emily. Don't come near me. Emily! Don't come near me. You know where Bert is now. He's just on the other side of the ledge. Bert! It's only a dream! Bert! Emily! Emily. I'm coming! Look out, Emily! You'll fall over that ledge! He's calling me! There's no one there! Let go of me! You're crazy! You'll go over the edge! You'll get down! Emily! Emily! Oh, I can't let you kill yourself! Uh, Emily. Make him let go of me. Oh. 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 Emily, get away from the ledge. Ah. I'm going to you. Ah. The police list it as an accident the second tragic accident to occur at that beautiful but seemingly fatal spot. 
what did happen? Once again, we present you with options. We could say, Stephen, consumed with jealousy, killed her. We could say, her guilty conscience killed her. Or, we could say, Bert came back to reclaim her. You can make a case for each, and also for me to return in just a few moments. Cigarette? No need for that. I'm ready. Blindfold? Dash it, man. Let's get it over with. As you wish. Hey! Hey! Henry, wake up. Uh You're dreaming again. Your tax audit? Yeah, today's the day. But you got all your records together. Yes, I do. Uh, Aren't you coming? You don't need me. You're ready. Mm. Can I help you, sir? uh, Oh, you're here for an audit. I, uh uh-huh. Won't you have a seat? Thank you. Well, now, let's see. If you have good records of your income and receipts for your deductions, an audit of your federal income tax return can be easier than you think. How did it go, Henry? Ha! No problem. Nothing I couldn't handle. This message presented on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service. She loves him. He loves her for reasons that defy all understanding. And once they fall in love, the passion can flame for a moment or for all eternity. We dwell on love here because all the other mysteries are slowly yielding to science, to technology. Soon love will be the only mystery left us. Besides those you will find here seven chilling times a week. Our cast included Ann Shepard, Mason Adams, Robert Dryden, and Robert L. Green. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'm sorry, is it? Something bothering you? Uh, yeah, yeah, plenty. Do you want to tell me? My wife is changing her will. How do you know? I know. Gifford called me. He's our lawyer. I'm being cut out. Completely? Oh. A few crumbs might be left for me. I don't expect it'll be much. Okay. What's the next move? I've spoken to her. She denies everything. Can you believe her? I want to. I want to, but there's this new doctor, Lopescu. He seems to exert a very strong and a sinister influence. Listen, Bill. And listen carefully. She hasn't much longer. No, no, Adrian. Adrian, you're... You're urging me to kill her, aren't you? You're telling me to commit murder. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... For someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help 
for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. From Hollywood, Laureen Tuttle in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. Now, Laureen Tuttle, outstanding radio and screen star in Legacy, a drama of the unexpected. How would you feel if it happened to you? Oh, sure, you can sit there now and say that I was crazy, that I didn't have a chance. But put yourself in my place. Go ahead, try it for a little while. You're a blonde, not too bad looking, with good legs and enough of a figure to make an 1895 dress look like 50 bucks. You're working a dreamland, going round and round like a horse on a carousel, getting nice fat blisters on top of the nice fat blisters that used to be your feet. You provide smiles, conversation, occasional brush-offs, and amusement for a new guy every five minutes. And it only costs him ten cents. That's it. Just ten cents. Then one rumba, the long, lanky character you're dancing with, lifts a seven-pound boot off your instep, leans down, and purrs in your ear. Baby, how'd you like to make ten million dollars? How much? Ten million. Only ten? There was a guy last week who offered me twenty. But I mean it. So did he, last week. Okay, baby. So you like being poor. Goodbye. Hey, wait a minute. Sorry, Miss Canfield. Dancing with you costs money. Remember? How'd you find out my name? Mm, somebody mentioned it. Yeah? Yeah. That's why I danced with you. Because of my name? Mm, among other things. My partners usually ask for encores. I only bought one ticket. You weren't very optimistic. No. I thought that's all it would take. You were wrong. So I was wrong. I've been turned down before. I'll get over it. Okay, Buster, so long. You got a different line anyway. You're a big-hearted millionaire in disguise who has a weak spot for taxi dancers. Not exactly. I'm a chauffeur for a small-hearted millionaire who never heard of taxi dancers. Oh, he's missed a lot. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. I'd like to have him meet one sometime. Me? Mm hmm, you. Maybe we should dance again. No more tickets. Oh, I've got an extra one. I keep it for emergencies. Isn't that against the rules? I break lots of rules, Buster. You're a bad girl. Do we dance? We can try. 
All right, Buster, what's the score? A touchdown. You'll carry the ball. Do you call the signals? Right. Well? Let's go out on the terrace. I want to give you the rules. I figured he was just another wolf with a slightly new approach. But at least I could stop dancing for a few minutes. Besides, he was tall and interesting looking in a sunburn sort of way. Well, what would you have done? I did just that and smiled as I took his arm and walked out to the terrace. Is your name really Irene Canfield? Why not? Any relation to J. Frederick Canfield? A millionaire? Mm Mm-hmm. No relation. How'd you like to be his niece? How would he like it? I wouldn't know the difference. Well, what have I got to lose? Ten million bucks if it doesn't work. And your good name? Oh, I wouldn't want to lose the ten million. What's the pitch? Old man Canfield's dying. I read it in the papers. And there's nobody to collect when he passes on. Nobody? Hmm. Except the niece, Marietta Canfield. But she's disappeared. Nobody's heard of her since the war began. She was caught in Europe and then no letters, no telegrams, no nothing. Well, maybe she'll turn up. Well, it's a chance we take. What did she look like? Well, the old man hasn't seen her for over 15 years. The war could have changed her. Anyway, you'll do. Why'd you pick me? Hunch. Same name, same looks. Just a hunch. What's in it for you? I figure you'll be a generous heiress. How generous? Very. Oh, but it couldn't work, Buster. The name's Rex. It couldn't work. Probably not. There isn't a chance. Too much risk. They'd find me out. Before you started. Well? When do we begin? Well, after all, a girl has to take some chances if she's going to get ahead in the world. You know what I mean. The next morning, Rex and I had a long huddle and then called our signals for the first play. I drew my savings out of the toe of a snag nylon and blew the whole thing on a couple of broad-shouldered, slim-waisted, simple, and very expensive gowns. Meanwhile, Rex got hold of a friend in New York who wired the joyful news of my impending arrival to the Canfield menage. Then, properly equipped, I strolled casually through the back door of the local airport carrying a suitcase covered with Paris labels and was met at the front door by Rex. In a matter of minutes, we were on our way in a long black limousine. All set, baby? I guess so. That's going to be a cinch. (sighs) Maybe. Sure. Telegram did it. What did the old man say? Not a word. He's too sick to talk. And the others? There aren't any others. None of the servants knew, dear Marietta. Oh, gee, honey, I'm scared. Be scared, baby. They'll all think it's grief. Well, here we are. Welcome home, Miss Marietta Canfield. How do you do, Miss Canfield? How do you do? I'm Mr. Canfield's butler. Uh, Of course. May I show you to your room? Uh, Thank you. Unless you'd prefer to see your uncle first. Well, is he... I mean, should I... After all, that's why you're here, isn't it? Well, I'm afraid I'd better... Very well. Follow me, please. I'll take you right to Mr. Canfield. I felt a little scream forming down in the pit of my stomach. It was too risky. The old man was still alive. He'd pick me for a phony at first glance. My mind rushed out of that vaulted hallway into the sleek limousine and back to my nice, noisy, peaceful dance hall... I wanted to run away. But my feet walked up the curving marble staircase and followed Hubert's frock-coated back into a tiny, undersized room. There, in an oversized bed, lay my new uncle, J. Frederick Canfield. Miss Marriott is here, Mr. Canfield. I knew you'd want to see her immediately. Uh, Hello, Uncle Fred. Skeleton-like figure on the bed moved one long nail claw with great effort. He was trying to say something, but he couldn't quite make the grade. So he just turned his head in my direction, slowly, as if he had to get out and push. He smiled at me, his eyebrows coming together and his gray lips turning up at the corners. And then I saw that it wasn't a smile at all. It was an evil grin. Uh, I'll leave now, Uncle Fred. I don't want to tire you. But we'll have a long talk about old times as soon as you're better, huh? Good night, Uncle Fred. Have a good sleep. And he 
did. He had a very good sleep because the next morning the butler rapped on my door, opened it, and walked in wearing a face that looked as if it had been tied in black ribbons. Sorry to awaken you, Miss Canfield, but I have some very bad news, very unpleasant. Yeah? Your uncle died last night. For the next couple of days, I was plenty scared. But when no relatives turned up for the funeral, it looked like Rex and I had really pulled it off. Of course, we couldn't be sure until after Mr. Smithson had read the will. But we weren't worried. And to each of my faithful servants who are in my employ at the time of my death, I bequeath $10,000. The remainder of my estate to be delivered to my niece, Marietta Canfield, at her request. <clears throat> uh, pardon me for digressing, Miss Canfield, but that should amount to something in the neighborhood of $9 million. Uh, did you hear what I said, Miss Canfield? Yeah, yeah, I heard you, Mr. Smithson. You said I was going to inherit something in the neighborhood of $9 million. <laughs> You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. Now for the surprising conclusion of Legacy, starring Miss Laureen Tuttle, a Hamilton Whitney production written by Robert Lippitt and Frank Burt and directed by Frank K. Danzig. Mr. Smithson continued reading the will. Rex moved behind my chair and I felt his fingers grip my shoulder. Hard. I smiled up at him. A nine million dollar smile. Now, there's uh, just one thing, Miss Canfield, before I go on. Yeah? You didn't get here until after your uncle's death, did you? No, no, the night before. He was very much alive. He smiled at me and nodded. Uh, Are you sure? Of course. Mr. Canfield's butler was there. He'll back me up. Oh. Well, then I'm obliged to read an amendment which your uncle fixed to this testament. Uh, Let me see. Oh, here. In view of the fact that my niece, Marietta, has seen fit to disobey my wishes at every opportunity... It is my desire that I never see her again. And in the event that she disobeys this final command and appears before me at any time during my life, the bequest to her is cancelled. The money is to be paid to the municipal hospital. Signed and witnessed, J. Frederick Canfield. So, I'm back at Dreamland. As bad as ever. Maybe worse. But I don't suppose I'd have known what to do with nine million dollars anyway. Would you? Legacy starred Miss Laureen Tuttle. Listen soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. This program was transcribed in Hollywood.
Algernon Blackwood's novella The Willows was originally published as part of Blackwood's 1907 collection The Listener and Other Stories. It is one of his best-known works and has been influential on a number of later writers. In fact, horror author H. P. Lovecraft considered the story The Willows to be the finest supernatural tale in English literature. And you can hear the story The Willows by Algernon Blackwood absolutely free. Visit the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com to find it. The Willows by Algernon Blackwood at WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Unit 99 to KMA 907. Unit 99, Sergeant Meredith, 909, in service, on the air. This is Sergeant Dan Meredith of Unit 99 at headquarters, Police Department, City of Sacramento, California. My detail is to ride in Unit 99, our tape recorder-equipped radio car, and to respond whenever the dispatcher transmits a signal to one of our other units on duty somewhere in the city. At the scene, we make the recordings for this program. Now, to tell you more about Unit 99, here is our chief, James V. Hicks, Sacramento Police. The job of a police officer is your protection. The cases you hear on this radio program are real cases. The police are real, the victims and the criminals are real. We are glad to provide Unit 99 and Sergeant Meredith so that you will hear how the police of a great city work night and day for your protection. Make no mistake about it. There are no actors on these tapes. They are real from beginning to end. Now to Unit 99, Sergeant Dan Meredith, on duty. Unit 9. Unit 9, 940 detectives at the south corner of the Fruit Ridge Shopping Center in the rear. A possible 460 in progress. Come in with lights out. Unit 4. Cover in for code 2. Unit 5. What is your location? KME 907. Detectives are requesting a unit to approach with lights out. 26834. Unit 4 is uh, responding to the call. Unit 9 was also contacted. Let's go out in that area. Unit 5, we're at 28th and Broadway. You still want us standing by? Uh, unit 5, you go out there too on that stuff. Uh, um, the rear of the Fruit Ridge Shopping Center, South End. Check. Okay, We're just arriving. The officers are all around it. Let's get out. All the sides are pretty well covered. Hello, McManus. The detectives are around back. One of the detectives is on the roof. It's believed to be a burglary in progress here. It's pretty cold. We have a, about a 40 mile an hour wind out here. In case you hear that noise, that is the wind blowing against the microphone. We'll stand by until we can get into the inside. Hello, sir. We come cruising out through here and we hear this heavy beating in here. It's like sounds like somebody working on a safe. Now we've got the whole place around it trying to get in. It looks like more like a hideaway job. Uh -huh. You haven't seen any force entry yet, have you? Yeah. Okay, they're trying to get you that information as to the owner. Yeah, We're, we called in for the owner to come out here and let us in the place. We'll stand by. Here's where they're, huh? here's where they're beating. It's coming out of there. Oh, is it still going on? Yeah, you'll hear it in a minute. Let's get over by there. You mean 
over by this gate and pull upstairs. That sound just like somebody using a sledgehammer. Then it sound like somebody was just uh, uh, yeah. working on the uh, the dial of the safe itself, punching it. We're punching it out. What'd you say, Mac? You still think? You think they're still in there? Everything's surrounded here. That's the only way we're gonna get in. You're the only one up there, Mac? No, there's a uniform officer up here. Okay. Let's go around the front. Well, Mac Alexander, one of the detectives on the roof, has found the hole which was punched through the roof. He believes that the uh, culprits are still on the inside. We have all four sides of the building surrounded. Also, the roof is pretty well covered now. It's quite a large store here, department store. I believe there are two detectives and two uh, uh, officers covering the roof. We have about 10 officers on the outside. Ropes? Yes. Do you know whether or not the uh, the owner is on the way? Well, they tried to notify the owner, but apparently they couldn't contact him. So they're going to have to go into the building the same way that the burglars are in there. Well, they got the set up lock from up on top so you can't get in, or what? No, they got the whole attic up there. Yeah. You've got to get in some way. Yeah, they came down through the roof. Yeah. You need a rope. Yes, you need a rope to get in from the attic down. How are they figuring on getting out of there? Probably going out through that uh, shipping door over in the other end there. It's all covered over there. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have a... Can't seem to contact the owner. And we have to get us. And we believe, I can see from outside here... The office is on the mezzanine section of the building, no doubt where the safe is. I see a flashlight inside, probably from our boys. I see somebody now coming through the, uh, the mezzanine there. It looks like an officer. I guess it is an officer. With the rope that we have, we'll be able to drop down inside. And after getting inside, we'll have the doors open, or one of them. Well, we're going to try. I think we can open it from the inside. Yeah, they have a, he's having a little difficulty there. It's too much of a drop. And he's still lodged on the edge of that uh, overhang. officer is still trying to get down. They still haven't to receive the rope from above. I don't think he can make it. That's too much of a drop there. Unless he gets help from someone else in there. Nice. He's going to try it. He's lowering himself. If he can get down to that partition there that he can stand on, there's a space of about 10 feet or 8 to 10 feet. He's hanging now. He's pretty close to the edge of that partition. He's on. He's in. He's in. Yeah. Oh, Jim. It's tall Jim Marty, one of our patrol officers. He just received his shotgun. He's assisting another officer, his partner, down in. Both of them are inside now. Let's see if we can get their attention, open this door. Down here. Here's the manager. 
Yeah. We have two officers in there now. We just got down in. See there? On the floor now. Is this the, uh, your office up there on the mezzanine? Yeah. And is your safe back in that yeah, area? You want to stand by outside? Okay, check everything now. We're inside. Alright. Yeah, it's open on the other side, on the south side. On the south side you can get in. Those are the officers on the outside talking through the door. Check behind everything. Let's go through here. Okay, let's go up by the office. Huh? Huh? I don't know yet when we're going up now and checking. Oh, they have somebody in the office, two of them. Yeah, they got him. Uh, you got, where were they hiding? Right in that back room? Now put the cuffs on these fellas. You got any tools around? They're in the room now. Fine. Now, where are you from? San Bernardino. San Bernardino? Mm -hmm. What kind of record do you have? None. None? How many times you fall, anyway? Huh? How many times you fell? You know what I'm talking about. No, I don't. You ever been to San Quentin, Folsom, or anything? Never fell in your life, huh? Huh? Walk, carry your tools, too. You got no record, nothing. What kind of a car did you use tonight? Didn't have any. You hooked a ride. You hooked a ride with all these tools? Let's go in and check the safe. This is the other one. What kind of record do you have? Not too good. Not too good. Well, what kind of record is that? Yeah. Robbery. Robbery? And what else? <laughs> How many times? I fell once. We came down on I fell twice. One was juvenile. We well, you how old are you now? I'm 23. 23. Oops, got him back from here. All this money here, uh, Camper, did you find this on these fellows? Uh, Lopes and I searched this fellow here, and uh, this is what he had in his pockets. Uh -huh. Just the two of you fellows? No, we got to get another shake out. All right, let's check the safe in here, see what damage they might have done. See, here's a crowbar, rope, brace and bit, small sledgehammer. Yeah, they have everything. Or oh, they've got part of the safe, which is mounted in a concrete square, half chiseled and broken away. This was probably a no doubt where all the uh, noise came from that was heard outside. Gloves, flashlights, bars. Mac Alexander, you and your partner, Zine, heard this as you were going by. Was that it? Making a routine patrol behind these buildings. We heard this uh, pounding noise. We shut off the motor, stopped, listened. It, it kept up, so we called for more squad cars, more assistance. We had to come in through the same hole they put in the roof, drop down on a rope to, to get back here to where they were. Here we have about a th three-quarter rope, brand new. With it is a knapsack and some clothing, old clothing. You this did is apparently what they carry their tools in. It's yeah. a, a knapsack. So. Old GI bag. That, yeah, here's a drill still in it. That appears to be the drill they used on the roof coming through. Here's some more chisels. Yeah. And a wrench. Yeah, they, I guess they were figuring on being here for quite some time. Tonight being Saturday, the place would be closed on a Sunday all day tomorrow, too. Well, they certainly have the tools we just for. Just came through. Yeah. This door open. You come through this door, Lopes? Yes. Where were they hiding, or where were they? One of them was standing just right about, about here, just at the edge of the door, and the other one was behind the door. When I kicked the door, I knocked them both off balance, I guess. Good. Did they threaten you in any manner? No, they, came, they put their hands in the air immediately. Good. Well, I knew that this place was surrounded. Uh, Apparently they had that impression because that of all time. the voices and so forth. Yeah. Uh, Did you find anything else on their person? 
just that uh, money and rolled coins that uh, this party here had on his uh, person when we... Where did you get this money that was found on you? Uh, out of the cash register drawer? Yeah. And how about these other uh, uh, drawers around here, the cash registers? I see one drawer is in there where you were working. Where did you get that? Uh, the same one. The same one? Yeah. Well, how long have you been working on this safe tonight? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. You've been in there for about a, two hours and say two hours and a half, two hours and 45 minutes. Is that right? That's right. Have you ever tried a safe before? No. Why is it that you tried one tonight? Broke. You're broke. Did you plan this with your partner? Hmm? Did you plan this pretty well in advance with your partner here? No, I just met him. I don't know. When did you meet him? Saturday. How long ago? When I met him on the road coming up here on the highway. From where? Huh? From where? I've been traveling all over. Man. Well, where did you pick him up or where did he pick I you just up? Met him, I just met him on the highway walking along. Walking? Yeah. Where did you get all these tools tonight? Huh? I had them. Huh? You had them? Those are brand new tools. About six months. Those are brand new. They haven't been used. Yes, they have, too. Where'd you get them? I bought them a surplus. Hey, Joe, you want to take this? Uh, you want to take him in? And uh, Capper, you going to take him in? Right. Okay. An efficient police department must have a high degree of mobility. You noted, I am sure, that in this case, patrol units converged on the scene within a few minutes of the first alarm and at least 10 officers were in and around the building. Further questioning of the suspects revealed a third participant outside the building in a car. Although he fled when the officers arrived, he was arrested in Fresno. The three admitted this and several other burglaries and were sentenced to the state penitentiary. Unit 99. 99, go ahead. 924, second floor. 924, second floor. Okay, 99, come in on seven. I've been expecting that call. We're going to question a burglary suspect. This is the fellow who staggered into the sheriff's office with a bullet in his chest, claiming he was shot in Southside Park. Later, he admitted a friend shot him while they were examining a gun. Now he's implicated in the burglary. Rogers and Mac Alexander are going to see what they can get out of him. Uh, Dan, you know this man that... Uh... Uh, shot himself or said uh, another fellow shot him. We've got some more inf uh, additional information on this boy, and we're going over and talk to him now. You want to come along? You and Roger's going. Great. Uh, fine, yeah. Hello there. How are you? Fine. How are you? How's that bullet? Uh, they, they ever taken it out yet? No. Is it, is it bothering in you? No. Well, we've got a little information here in which we uh, understand that you're involved in a, a burglary here in town, at least one that we know of. Want to know if you want to tell us about it? I don't know nothing about it myself. That's why I have, the cops told me that I was involved in one, but I don't know nothing about no burglary. Well, we have your partner in. He admits it, and he names you as his accomplice. Well, I can't help what my partners say, uh... I haven't done what he's talking about myself. Everything else he has told us has checked out uh, to be the truth. I wouldn't know why. I wouldn't know why he would have implicated me. He's never been mad at you, has he, or want to cause you any trouble? I wouldn't know that. Where'd you get those guns? Like that, as I told, as I told a cop of the day um, that we posted, how we bought them right there. Where'd you buy them? I'm a guy. What guy? I don't know him. Whereabouts did you buy him from? Down on Fourth. Fourth where? Fourth, four, fourth between L and Capital. Was he a white man or a colored man? He was a colored man, about about thirty-six, I guess. Yeah, what was his weight? I guess he weighed about hundred eighty, something like that. How tall was he? About your size. What was he wearing? I wouldn't pay no attention what we was wearing. How much did you give him for the guns? I gave him $35 for both. both. 
Who was with you at the time that you bought them? Me and this, uh, my partner supposed to be. You didn't buy the guns, did you? Yeah, I bought them. Your partner, he implicates you as the one in on the burglary as well as the guns. I can't say what I can't, I can't what my partner say. Well, why should he get you and finger you on this job? He could have kept his mouth shut, too. I can't with my partner. He was with you at the time of the shooting. So was last more people with me at the time I shooting. But well, what would you want these guns for in the first place? You're not supposed to possess a gun. As like guns. How come your partner said that uh, uh, you say you gave $35 for the guns and your partner says he gave $7 for the gun? I can't help what my partner said. He was, he wasn't, he was there at the time, but he wasn't in his right mind. What do you mean, not in his right mind? Well, we had been drinking a little bit. Well, even if you did uh, buy the guns, as you say, uh, that small price that you gave for them, doesn't that indicate to you that they were probably hot, stolen guns? No. They in new condition like that? No. It doesn't? Have you been working? Yes, I work. Once in a while. Where? I was working down at car lot. Car lot doing what? Washing cars. What uh, kind of a salary did you get down there? Dollar hour. And you could afford to go out and buy uh, two guns for $35? Or not. Money's made to spend, isn't it? Why did you buy these guns? Buy somebody I wanted to give one of them to. Well, how about the other one? I was going to keep one of them. Why? As I said before, I like guns. That's not a very good reason. You know that yourself. That's the best reason I think of at the time. People just buy what they like, isn't it? Well, that's rather hard for us to believe. You know, uh, you lied to us at first about uh, being shot in the park. Then you changed your story to getting uh, uh, shooting yourself. Then you changed it again to getting accidentally shot when you, were, you and your friend were playing with those guns. Now, as I said before, what he has told us about this burglary has checked out. And he names you as his partner. Now, who do you think we, we're going to believe? We are going to believe him, probably. I think we will. We have no alternative. Uh, what's he charged with now? Violation of parole and burglary. This man, although he had been implicated in a burglary by his associate, steadfastly denied the crime. He did, however, admit possession of a gun, which, as an ex-convict, placed him in violation of the law as well as in violation of his parole. The case is still pending. I sincerely hope that you have enjoyed your ride with Unit 99 tonight and that you will join us for another tour of duty. This is Unit 99 in Sacramento, California. These on-the-scene tape recordings were provided by the Sacramento Police Department and were made on duty by Sergeant Dan Meredith in Unit 99. Your host is Chief James V. Hicks of the Sacramento Police Department. Be with us when once again you will hear... KMA 907, Sacramento Police. Unit 99, are you in the clear? Unit 99 to KMA 907. Unit 99, Sergeant Meredith, 909, in service, on the air. Unit 99, with Sergeant Dan Meredith in service, on the air, will be heard again next week at this same time and over this same station. Join us then for another interesting on-the-spot report of actual happenings as they were tape-recorded by members of the Sacramento Police Department. The events described are real. The voices of the people heard are the actual voices of those involved in the police investigation. Police officers, detectives, victims... Suspects. These are not actors. These are the actual people involved. Unit 99 is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
I've often joked about how instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. In this case, I wholeheartedly approve. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I have no idea how they accomplished that. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. I don't crash after four or five hours when it wears off because it doesn't. It builds up in my system to give me consistent focus, clearer thought, energy without being jittery, and like I said, motivation. Magic Mind is doctors validated, it has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like Cognizine Cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano-encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. And they even give five cents from every bottle sold to help those who are homeless. So I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved because I just love what it's doing for me. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and get started. That's magicmind.com slash darkness. And at checkout, use the code DARKNESS for up to 40% off your first subscription or 20% off your one-time purchase. That's only for a limited time, though, so you're going to want to jump on this. It's magicmind.com slash darkness, and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. Unsolved Mysteries. Truth is stranger than fiction. We are endeavoring to bring to you little-known mysteries of the entire world, and in this series of unexplained true happenings, we cannot overlook the puzzling and weird practices found in voodooism. There are strange stories of zombies, stories which filter into the world of everyday life, leaving no room for doubt that within the cult of voodooism in Haiti, zombies do exist. scene is glamorous Haiti, a few miles from Port-au-Prince, a long, low, rambling bungalow bathed in the liquid beams of a silver moon faces the open sea. Behind the cape rises in serried ridges of blacks and purples, and beyond that, faintly ominous, the deep, constant rhythm of the voodoo drums seems to belong to another world. 
three men sit on the lanai or veranda facing the beach. One of them, tall, slender, young in years, but with gray hair and lined face, stares out into nothing. The elderly man by his side looks at the third and raises bushy eyebrows. The third man, a stranger to Haiti, speaks. Very decent of you fellows to invite me out here. I sort of feel that, well, that I'm putting you to a lot of extra work. Not a bit of it. Servants take care of all the extra work. We're glad of your company. Clark. Yes, Strong? I'm going down there. You must? Yes. But don't be long. I won't. But don't wait up for me. Good night. Good night. Good night. In a moment, after Strong's out of hearing, I'll be able to explain. That's all right. I think I understand. Just a minute. I'll look down the pathway. Yes, he's gone all right. In spite of what he said, we can't turn in. And although you're a stranger here, I'm going to do what white men have to do in the tropics. I'm going to ask for your help if I need it. You won't have to ask twice. I didn't think so. That's why I asked you at the hotel if you'd like to come out to our place. A few moments ago, you said you thought you understood. Yes, I know, of course. But it was just a year ago today that Strong's wife died. I was in New York at the time, and we were all very much upset. I never knew Strong, but I went to school with his wife, Helen. Well, it isn't because of his wife's death that I want you tonight. But because of what happened after her death. After her death? Yes. Do you know where Strong went just now? No. He went down to her grave, as he has every night for six months or more. Good heavens, why? That's what I'm going to explain. When Strong first came out here, he had a native servant girl. Clarissima, her name was. Attractive little thing, and she fell in love with Strong. Strong never gave her a thought. But you know native women. Yes, of course. Well, Helen came out here. And the night before their marriage, they were sitting just about here on the veranda. Oh, John, it's so grand to be here with you. And then what do you think it is for me, darling? To have you here in my arms. To know that tomorrow you'll be mine forever, darling. Yes, John, forever. Oh, when I think of the nights I've sat out here dreaming, watching the ships sailing for the States, and then other nights when I've watched these same steamers come into the harbor and tried to imagine what you'd look like standing there on the deck coming out to me. <laughs> Did your dream come true, dear, or did you find me changed? Oh, what a little changed, yes, darling. But better than a thousand dreams. Oh, it's eleven o'clock, darling. Time for little girls to be in bed, especially when they're going to be married in the morning. <laughs> I hate to think of driving you out of your bungalow, even for one night. I could just as easily have stayed at the one time. Oh, not a bit of it, dear. It'll take me less than five minutes to walk down to Clark's place. Good night, dear. Good night, John. John. Why, Clarissima, what on earth are you doing here at this time of night? Why aren't you home with your father? I have been watching you. You've been watching me? You and the woman. What's the matter with you? What's come over you? What business have you watching us? I have every business. You belong to me. I belong to you? What rubbish is this you're talking? No rubbish, John. You have belonged to me since that night that the Bokar placed his spell upon you. Have you been drinking, Clarissima? You know I do not drink. John, if you marry this woman, I tell you something. In three months, she will be dead. Oh, now listen, Clarissima. I'm not afraid of your bokors, your voodoos, or your wanga. I have told you. Marry that woman, and before the setting of the third moon, she will be dead. Clarissima spoke the truth. Before the third moon had set, Helen was dead. In his grief, John gave no thought to her prophecy. Gave no thought to the warning that the wanga or spell of the bokor had been placed upon her. Clark, John Strong's friend, came to live with him. And one afternoon, Strong, arriving home earlier than usual, came up the veranda steps in time to hear Clark talking to one of the native servants. I tell it to you, Master. I have heard it too many times. It's nonsense, Loma. Just jungle talk. Native rubbish. No, Master. Many times before, a white man, he say rubbish. But me, Loma, he see zombie. Not one zombie. Not two but many zombies work back there in sugar cane fields. But not a white woman, Loma. No one ever saw... What's all this, Clark? Oh, uh, we were just talking. Didn't hear you come in. I know you didn't. And I'm sorry, old man, but I listened. Oh. Yes, I listened. I know you were talking about Helen. Now, what was it? Oh, just jungle nonsense. There's nothing to even think about. I'll be the best judge of that. Tell me, Loma. No. No, master. If master understand... He know us. Tell me, Loma. Oh, come strong. You're making a fuss over nothing. Loma! 
Yes, master. Did I ever beat you? No, master. I'm going to, Loma. Beat you till you can't stand if you don't tell me. Listen, John, this is no way to behave. I tell you, you come with me and I'll explain. Come? Where? Come along and I'll show you. Together, the two men leave the bungalow. Loma, his eyes filled with tears, stands at the top of the Lanai steps and watches them disappear into the underbrush. Down toward the sea, Clark leads the way. His set jaw, the only answer to Strong's question. But, Clark, this pathway doesn't lead any place except to the cemetery. I know it. That's where we're going. What in heaven's name is it all about? Why don't you tell me? I want to prove that the whole thing is nonsense before I tell you. I thought you were my friend. I'm friend enough to want to save your reason. Oh, there's an open grave. Uh, go ahead. I want to get that spade. Clark. Clark. What? Helen's grave. It's been opened. What? Her grave, Clark. It's been opened. You'll find out in a minute. Now stand back while I dig. Oh, let me, Clark. Let me. No. Oh, it, it ought to be. Not yet. Clark. Clark. The casket's gone. These devils have taken her. My Helen for their damnable voodoo. No, John, no. Zombies. At breakneck speed, the two men race back to their bungalow. Loma from the veranda sees them coming up the pathway and runs to meet them. In silence, Clark points to the brush, and Loma in the lead breaks into the thick tropic growth. Dusk finds them struggling up the steep slopes of the cape with that energy born of frenzied fear and nameless horror. Loma holds up his hand. In the strained silence, the men listen to the sharp crack of cane knives on stalks of cane, the crackling of falling cane leaves. Loma motions strong to come forward. He forces aside the sugar cane and stares, horror-stricken, into the clearing. Helen! 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 Horrible clock. Ghastly story. You understand now why John acts as he does. And why I wanted you here tonight. Then she was buried alive? No, she wasn't buried alive. But she wasn't dead? Yes, she was dead. She was a zombie. A dead person raised from the grave. A body without mind or soul. But it's impossible. That's what I said to Loma. No, Helen was dead. Killed by the curse brought on her by Clarissa's jealous hatred. And raised from the grave to be a zombie by the same voodooism that killed her. Yes, yes. Uh, Clarissa, what happened to her? The natives killed her. And Helen, you... You buried her again? After we had salt. Salt? Yes, salt. If zombies eat anything containing salt, they return to their graves in peace. And you fed her salt? Yes, she... she crumpled up at our feet, dead, really dead. Out of deference to people who are still alive, character names in these unsolved mysteries have been changed. Inasmuch as any solution must of necessity be supposition, liberties of time, place, and character exist in the solution that will be presented after you have heard from your sponsor.
ladies and gentlemen, the solution for which you've been waiting. Have you really a reasonable explanation of how such a thing could have happened? I'll answer that by asking you a question. Do you think that any explanation of such a ghastly affair could be classified as reasonable? No, I suppose not. But it happened, and so I say, how could it happen? In the first place, don't imagine this is an isolated case. So serious is the matter of zombies in the island of Haiti that the government has been compelled to pass the following law, Article 249 of the Code Penal of the Republic of Haiti. Also shall be qualified as attempted murder the employment which may be made against any person of substances which, without causing actual death, produces a lethargic coma more or less prolonged. If, after the administration of such substances, the person has been buried, the act shall be considered murder, no matter what the result that follows. Then the government thinks that these zombies are people who have been poisoned and who have been certified as dead and buried while in a state of suspended animation. I mean that they have been given a poison that kills the brain but leaves their motor faculties unimpaired. Between you and me, I don't think that the government really believes that. But after all, how would you try to frame a law against taking corpses out of their graves and making them work in the cane field? Yes, I see the difficulty there. But just the same, I don't see how even Buddhism can make a corpse walk. Have you ever heard of inanimate objects being moved by the power of mind? Yes, I have. And isn't it possible that the same worker in black magic or Buddhism that killed the person by power of mind could take that inanimate object to the corpse and make it move? Do you believe that? Yes. And I'll give you the final proof, at least my way of thinking. What is that? The fact that the natives themselves killed Clarissima, the native girl, because they knew that with the assistance of the witch doctors, she killed and made a zombie out of Helen. <laughs> Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows, shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them on to their venture in the dark. There are some men whose entire lives are concerned with evil. They're born to flourish and die in the shadows. Their every move is a venture in the dark. It is a story we tell you tonight as we present Marvin Miller and Eric Snowden in Pursuit. <laughs> A 
dark, deserted side street within the inner reaches of London. In the distance, Big Ben somberly tolls the evening hour. Quiet now. Here he comes. You see, Henry? You see how I followed your orders? Every day for a week I've watched him. Not so loud. Every day he takes the same streets. A tedious little man walled in by habit. What's that? Nothing, Lord, nothing. I'm sure he has the money. Sure as death, Henry. When he left his office, he was counting the notes. <laughs> See how thorough I am? All right, now shut up. When he gets here, you know what to do. Don't make any mistakes this time. Well, what do I ever do that was... Shut up, I said. It is. Go on. Uh, beg pardon, sir? Uh, oh, what's that? You wouldn't happen to have a match now, would you? Oh. Oh, Matt, you startled me for a moment. I didn't see you there in the darkness. Yes, certainly I have a match. Do you care for a smoke? No, thank you. Yeah, I'll strike the match for you. Blow out that flame, Bart. What? Keep your hands just where they are now. You shouldn't have let him strike that match, you fool. Yeah, but Get I... down the street and keep a sharp watch. Now, see here, I... Go on, Bart, move. All right, Henry, but, but I didn't mean to have him strike the match. Swap me, I didn't. Go right to your wallet. You'll not get away with this. It's all clear, Henry. I have influence, I want you to know. Great influence. You've picked the wrong man tonight. Stop jabbering. Take that ring off your finger. Come on, get it off. What are you trembling about? A man with your influence? The ring's stuck. You'd better hurry and get it off, mister. Uh, here you are. Someone's coming down the street. You see? You'll never get away with it. Now your pocket watch, hung so elegantly across your plump stomach. Henry, they're still coming. Hurry. Uh, Fine-looking watch. You'll pay for this. You'll see. I'll have you tracked down. Remember, I saw your faces when I struck the light, do I? You did at that, didn't you? Well, well, at least I I think I... Henry, it's two of them. They're just down the street. I'm almost through. No, it's too bad you've such keen eyesight, my friend. I really don't think I could identify you positively. I mean... I just caught a momentary glimpse, I... Yes. Please. Please don't do anything to me. I've I've got three children at home. That's very unfortunate. I feel so sorry for your three children. Don't use that gun. Please. I'll give you anything. I'll... Henry! You shot him! You shouldn't have done that, Henry. What's this, Bart? Are you trying to tell me what to do? No, but you heard what he said. He's a man of influence. Don't let that bother you, Bart. His influence is now at an end. I'll be glad to get in the house tonight, right enough. This night's done me in. It's a fine night, Bart. Look at those stars winking down at us as if they shared our every secret. <laughs> there you go, talking crazy again. I wonder what we got out of him. We'll count it when we get in the room. You see how I'm learning, Henry? Knew just the streets he'd take and right to the minute. Yes, it was also very clever of you to let him strike that match. Uh, well, uh, here we are, home sweet home, up the stairs He's and... walking down the street. What? Do as I say. Sure, Henry. Walk natural, not too fast. What's wrong? I don't know. But there were two policemen waiting for us in the hallway. This is Henry Bell, Mrs. Graham. What are you calling me for? I don't want no trouble. Oh, I'm trying to keep you from trouble. A friend of mine said he passed your rooming house tonight. There were police in the hallway. Knew I roomed with you, so he told me. I just called to see if I could be of help, that's all. Who are you trying to fool, Henry Bell? Yeah? You know why the police are at my house. They're waiting for you and Bart. For me? I should go right into the hall and call them. Where are you telephoning from? Well, what do they want of us? By the looks of them, it's no social call, then, my kid. Well, we've not done anything. Well, that 
not what they say. They say you've killed a man, a very important man. That's a lie. Not according to them. The man saw your faces for a moment. From his description before he died, the police know it's you and Bart. Thank you very much, Mrs. Graham. Wait, don't go yet. If I find out anything else, where can I reach you? What's that? What are you trying to pull off? Nothing, nothing at all. I just want to help you and Bart, that's all. Goodbye, Mrs. Graham. No, don't hang up yet. Do you think I'm going to give you time to trace this call? I'm so sorry. I can't oblige. Give me the phone. Bell, this is Inspector Lane of Scotland Yard. Yes, Inspector. Goodbye to you, too. It's no use, Bell. You have no chance in the world. Give yourself up. I don't think so, Inspector. You shot the wrong man tonight, Bell. You shot Donald Bailey. The right honourable Donald Bailey with a seat in the House of Commons. I'm getting up in the world, aren't I? We'll catch you before morning. We're forming a dragnet that stretches across the entire city. You can't escape. Is that so, Inspector? Would you like to wager on it? Well, did you get the train tickets? I couldn't, Henry. I just couldn't. They got coppers all over the railway station. Starts to do anything right anymore. What are we going to do, Henry? What are we going to do? Hello, Dick. Listen, you've got to hide us out. We've been running from the police all night. We can't take it much longer. Uh, Dick? Dick, are you there? Hello? Hello, hello? Henry. Not so loud. Will he help us? I'm worn out, I tell you. I'm worn out. Will he help us? He wants no part of us. No one in the old blooming city will help us, and that's a fact. The young great. And that ain't all, Henry. What? The coppers have thrown a barricade around this entire district. Won't let anyone in or out. And all the time they're squeezing in tighter. Squeezing in tighter, Henry. What makes you think Sam will help us, Henry? Sam will do anything for money. You shouldn't have killed him, Henry. Not a right honourable gentleman like him. Right honourable gentleman. What else should I have done? I don't know. You're the one that always figures out. You're supposed to watch out for us. I am watching out for us. If you hadn't let him strike that match and let him see our faces, this would never have happened. Oh, I do like you tell me, Henry. It's like I always say, you've got the brains, but you need more than brains, and that's where I come in. Then do as I tell you now. Stop talking. Come along. Wait. Look. There's someone walking down the street. Let him walk. Act natural. I think it's a copper, Henry. Just keep walking. Here, let's turn down the street. Henry. Henry. I tell you, it's a copper. Look. He's turning down the street with us. All right. Just take it easy. Don't do anything to raise his suspicion. I'm scared, Henry. I'm scared. Shut up. There, you see. He didn't follow us. Here, that's Sam's house just ahead. He'll hide us out. I hope so. Up these stairs. I'll ring the bell. Why doesn't he answer? Take it easy. Where is he? Who's there? It's me, Sam. Henry. Okay. Sam, we're in trouble. Terrible trouble. Quiet, Bart. Sam, we got into a little mix-up tonight. I heard all about it. Yeah. Come we're, on. We're obliged, Sam. Much obliged. Been, been running from the coppers all night. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, sit down. Rest yourself. <laughs> Bart gets a bit excited, Sam. It's really not that bad. Not bad, he says. How much did you get off the guy? Well, we haven't counted it yet. Look, every cop in town is looking for you. I'm taking a big chance doing this. What do you mean, Sam? How much did you get? Oh, uh, we'll take care of you, Sam. I'll take care of myself. So that's the way it is, eh? That's the way it is. It's a dirty trick. You think so? Come here to the window, both of you. Look through these curtains. The 
copper. Right. Yeah, he's the one that was following us. You see, I'm sticking my neck way out. And I'm not doing it for my help. Uh, we didn't get very much, Sam. Don't give me that. Come on, let's see it. But, yes, Henry? I want to talk to Sam alone. Uh, but, Henry, we don't have no secrets, you and I. We are partners, we are. Uh, but, why don't you go in the back and wash up, huh? You but do I... as Sam says, but well, go on. All right, all right. But it's a mighty peculiar way for a partner to act, if you ask me. Now, what did you want to talk about, Henry? I need the money I got tonight, Sam. I've got plans. Great plans running through my brain. You have, huh? <laughs> you don't imagine for one minute, do you, Sam, that I'm content doing what I am now? Bart seems content. Oh, that ox. If he hadn't let that fellow strike that match, we wouldn't have been in this mess at all. No, I'm afraid my plans go beyond my friend Bart. Well, what's all this got to do with me? You're from America, where they know how to think big. I admire you, Sam. You think like I think. You're quick to grab hold of an opportunity when it presents itself. I like that in a man. Well? I've got a few deals in my mind where I could use a man like you. You're smart, Sam. Very smart. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I know one thing. I'm too smart to hook up with a marked man. Not. You killed the wrong fellow, Henry. Oh, but that was Bart's fault. I don't care whose fault it was. You got a date with a noose. They may delay it by thrashing about this way and that, but in the end, they'll catch you. That's not true. Have you finished your little talk, you two? I think so. I'll take the wallet, Henry. It's not fair, Sam. All right, I'm a reasonable man. I'll take nothing, and you can go back to the street. Here's the wallet. Thank you. After all, Henry, you just said you admired me because I grab hold of an opportunity when it presents itself. Anything else? Just this ring. How about cufflinks or watches? Didn't you pick the guy's watch? He wasn't carrying a watch. Okay. You two go in the next room and get some sleep. Go on. Yeah, I'm so fagged out, I could sleep forever. You'll be on the lookout, won't you, Sam? Sure. Sure. Go on, go to sleep and don't worry. Lighter. He had no business taking the ring and wallet. Well, there ain't much we can do about it. He took everything. Not everything. What do you mean? I'm not exactly a fool, Bart. Look at this watch. Didn't get that. Say, that looks pretty. It's a fine watch. Solid gold. Yeah, we'll be able to get ten pounds on that, all right. Ten pounds, nothing. I'm... I'm retaining this watch. I've been needing one for some time now. Yeah, that ain't fair, Henry. Why not? Oh, we're supposed to be partners. We are. That means 50-50 on everything. Don't be such a fool, Bart. I'm the one that runs this little partnership. Remember that. Well, all the same. All the same, nothing. I'm keeping this watch, and I don't want to hear you mention it again. You're acting mighty queer, Henry. You didn't used to be like this. Perhaps I don't appreciate your stupidity as much as I should. Yes, perhaps that's it. Oh, tonight was just a mistake. Just a mistake. Where are you going? I'm going to turn out the lights. Why? I want to see if that copper's still out in front. Well, that's more like it, Bart. It shows some signs of having a brain when you think of things like that. I'll just raise this blind a bit and... Henry! Stop shouting like that. Come here, quick. What is it now? Look down there on the street. Where? There's Sam talking to the policeman, and he's pointing to this house. Why, that... Now they're coming across the street. What are we going to do? Come on, quick. There's a back entrance to this house. But where can we go now? We've no time to think about that. Let's get out of here. Gents, cup of tea. Same for me. Two cups of tea. Nothing else? I've got some fine slab cake. Nothing else, just tea. Tea it is. What are we going to do? Let me think. 
If we only had enough money to get away, we could hire a car. Now, who's talking about that? We haven't a penny. Oh, you could get some money for that watch at this time of night. Oh, we could find a pawn shop somewhere. We, we could sell it to someone on the street. It's out. I have a right to keep the watch. It gives me a certain distinction. I don't intend to give it up. But it's our own... Shh, waiter's coming back. Here's your tea. You sure you don't want some slab cake? How late do you stay open? Till midnight. The underground train stop running at half past eleven. And I get a pretty good trade from them. Oh. Uh, suppose you bring me a slice of that cake, if it's as good as you say it is. Slab cake, right, too. You hear what he said? Does a good business here. Yeah, must have plenty in the till. That's what you're thinking, eh, Henry? If we had enough money, we could get away from here till it cools off. Yeah, that's right. You suppose you could do something right for a change? Well, Henry, I didn't mean to. Here he comes again. Here you are. Now, if you don't mind, I want to get the news. It's just coming on. This is the BBC News resume. The conference at Potsdam is proceeding well, according to reports. Prime Minister Attlee has returned to Next Potsdam time he comes back, we'll do it. Sector. All right, Henry. When I put the gun on him... You make a rush for the cash register. And to move fast because a customer might come in at any minute. Wait. Listen to the wireless. It's about us. Promise an arrest within a very few hours. Names and descriptions of the criminals are known to the authorities. Every means of escape is being watched. Why don't we give ourselves up, Henry? I tell you, it's no use. We'll not give ourselves up. But... Uh, I told you before, I'm making the decisions. They're getting closer all the time. I can feel it. I can, like a noose around me neck. Don't talk like that. And all for nothing. All we got out of it was an old watch. It's the breaks of the game. It's a mighty fine watch. All the time getting closer. You heard what the wireless said. There's nothing left for us to do. Here comes a car down the street. Yes, here, in this doorway. Stop him. All right, men. Let's give this block the going over. They can't be far from us now. You hear that? Yes, I hear it all right. Let's give up, Henry. No. Maybe they'll give us a chance. They'll not give us any chance. Hurry, walk down this alleyway. Keep close to the wall. We'll never get away. They haven't caught us yet, my lad. The night's only begun. Wait a minute. What's that entrance down there at the end of the street? I don't see it. There, there, with the warning lights burning over it. There, look. Looks like the subway entrance. There's a sign on it. Let's see if I can read it by the light of a street lamp. Yeah, the cops will be on us in a few moments. Be quiet. Let me see. Station no longer in use. Enter through Brighton Station, two squares north. Come on, Henry. This gives me an idea. We can't waste any time. You remember what the waiter said? What? He said the train stopped running at 11.30. After that, the tube's empty until early morning. Well? Let me look at my watch. Almost 20 minutes to 12. We finally got a break. What do you mean? The subways will be empty. We can escape through the tube. Is it safe? Oh, certainly it's safe. Look at the watch for yourself. 11.40, it says. Hey, you! Stop. Henry, it's Stop. them. Stop! Tell me, Steps, hurry! There they go! Watch, Bobby! Hurry, hurry. Oh, my ankle. Oh, come on, I come on. Can't. Yes, you can. They're going down that subway. Bring up the lights. We're trapped, Henry. No, we're not. not. We're, we're going along the tracks. But it's dangerous. It's not dangerous. Remember the train stopped running 15 minutes ago. Come on. Ooh, my ankle hurts. Do you see them anywhere? Well, they must have gone down the line. All right, after them. Henry, they'll, they'll catch us this time. No, they won't. I keep stumbling against the rails. I'm going to light a match and see where we are. But that's what got us into trouble before, Henry. They have to take a chance now. There they are. Come out, man. We've got to cut off. Henry! Forget it. We have a way out. A way out? Where? I can see it in the light. Just a few feet, the subway branches off. We have a 50 50 chance that we take the tunnel to the left. Two constables wouldn't dare split up knowing I have a gun. Yeah, maybe that's right. I know it's right. Bill, are you coming out? 
I'm afraid I can't oblige, Inspector. Afraid I can't oblige. I think we're going to be all right. I told you so. They took the main tunnel, just as I figured. You get frightened too easily, Bart. Yeah, but it's so black in here and narrow. Just room for the rails. That's what it was made for. You'll have to be careful to get out before morning, before the trains start running again. You won't have to worry about that. But if we went to sleep... Oh, I hate to think about what would happen. I said, you won't have to worry about that. What do you mean, Henry? I've been thinking. About what? About a lot of things. You know, being down here a hundred feet beneath the earth is good for the mind. Ah, uh, there you go talking crazy again. Oh, crazy, is it, about? Well, here's something for you to think over, my boy. What are you talking about? You're stupid, Bart. You know that, don't you? Well, you're big and strong, but you can't think, Bart. You rely on me for everything. Well, I do my best, Henry. You can't say that I... You have a very bad habit of interrupting, Bart. I'm sorry. Didn't you ever wonder why I bothered to take you along with me on these jobs? Well, I... Well, I'll tell you, Bart. I'm a man of mentality. I'm a planner. But I don't like to soil my hands with dirty work. That's why I let you hang around, just to do my dirty work. Well, I always figure you need more than brains. You need muscles, too. I didn't think it was just dirty work, Henry. I don't know what you're getting at. Just this. You're no help to me anymore. You've hurt your ankle, and in the morning you'll have trouble moving around. And then, too... Your attitude's been annoying me. Well, what, what have I when done? When I'm annoyed by someone, I just walk out on them. Henry! But in your case, there's a drawback to that. You see, I don't want you around to talk to the police, Bart. So there's only one thing I can do. I'll have to kill you. You may have the brains, Henry, but I'm strong enough to kill you with one swipe. There you are, Bart. You forget I have the gun. Strange, isn't it, how a gun can make me just as strong as you? Don't do it, Henry. We've always been a team. Don't do it. As the body of Bart drops to the tracks, a thin smile crosses Henry's lips. Then he straightens his clothes and begins walking down the track. Somewhere along the line, there'd be a station. He would escape through that. Without Bart, he could move around quickly, lay low till the excitement died down, then come back again. He began whistling as he walked along, hands in his pockets. His fingers touched the fine gold watch. That was something really to be proud of. Yes, he would go away. Maybe, maybe he'd go to the sea. A nice rest wouldn't hurt him. He'd always find a way to pick up a few pounds and maybe find a sweet young thing to... What's that? Henry pauses uncertainly, looks back where the sound is growing. But the sound was getting nearer and nearer. The train! It can't be, can't be! I've got to get out of here! I've got to get out of here! He stumbles over the tracks, jumps to his feet and rushes on. His hands brush the narrow walls for some way of escape. It can't be! It can't be! The train stopped running at 11.30. It just can't be! But now the sound of the approaching train fills the tunnel. No escape. No escape. <laughs> then, in the growing light, Henry sees a way out. A door! An emergency door! Oh, I've got to get it open! Get it open! He throws himself against the door, his fingers tighten around the handle. The rumble of the train is now a continuous thunder. Turn open! Turn open! It must! It must! But the handle, unused for years, refuses to budge. Now the train is rounding the last bend and tunnel, its headlights spearing through the gloom. Open! 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 But Henry hasn't the strength to open the door. 
in his last frantic terror as he turns to face the onrushing train, a sudden thought knifes its way to his tortured mind. You need more than brains, Henry. You need muscles, too. Bart had said that. Bart had the strength. Bart could have opened the door. Henry raises his arms as if to ward off a terrible blow. And the train thunders on. Across London, in a small office in the city morgue, the widow of the Right Honorable Donald Bailey has come to claim the personal effects of her late husband. This is all we found on him, madam. His clothes, this tie clip, the umbrella, and the loose change. They weren't satisfied to steal his wallet and his ring. They even had to take his watch. Was it a valuable watch? Only to him. It had been in his family for generations and had become quite antiquated. Kept time very badly. Gained an hour a day or more. Yes, I dare say whoever stole the watch will have nothing but trouble. If time means anything to him. Next week, over most of these stations, we'll bring you another original story about the land of the shadows, Eclipse, the strange tale of a man who woke from unconsciousness to find himself a hunted murderer. It will give you another opportunity to examine at close range the strange impulses which lure human beings into their dark venture. <laughs> Pursuit was written by Larry Marcus and Robert Light and featured Marvin Miller as Henry and Eric Snowden as Bart. The narrator was John Lake. Original music by Dean Fossler. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, your government needs your help during the current meat shortage. Yes, your government asks you as a patriotic duty to play square with meat. If every person paid no more than legal ceiling prices and exchanged the proper ration points for meat, the black market would be stamped out. It's that simple and that difficult. Your government, through the Office of Price Administration, sets these rationing and price controls to protect you, to ensure you that you'll get your fair share of the meat available. So do your share. Play square with meat. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so bad it's good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv.
Out of the past, phantoms of a world gone by speak again their immortal kill. A passion in the desert. Have you ever noticed how very much a woman is like a beast? The resemblance, no doubt, is due to the fact that they have so very much in common. Any man of us frequently has seen a woman turn into a beast or a good facsimile thereof at any provocation. But there is only one man of my experience who saw a beast turn into a woman. He was a Frenchman by the name of Gaston Monet. It all started in Upper Egypt. A column of soldiers of the French Foreign Legion was on the march to join their eastern flank. After three months of marching and fighting, guerrilla fashion, this particular group came to a small Arab village named Dela Heba. Strangely enough, in that isolated, dirty village, there was one white woman. You've no idea what a white woman looks like to a soldier who's been on the march for months. And this one, well, she was no ordinary woman. She was lithe and supple, like a desert panther. Her skin was tanned by the sun, and her hair, it was hairy and brown with gold lights. And her eyes, they were the most amazing part of her. They were large yellow orbs, remote and fathomless. She stood in the narrow streets watching the column of soldiers march by, and then she glided out from the group of gaping natives and brushed one soldier's shoulder with her hand. Gaston's shoulder. He turned and... What do you want? I must talk to you. I can be caught, Marshal, for talking to you. Tell the important, please. Not now. I, I'll meet you later. Please, please go back. Later? When? Midnight tonight? If you fail me, I will die. Don't fail me. Midnight, then. But where? At the end of the palms. Where you entered the city. Oh, goodbye. Go quickly before you're seen. Goodbye. Come in. Halt! We'll make camp at the outer gate of the city. Do you understand? Come in. Halt! Michelle, wasn't she a beauty? What are you talking about, Gaston? I did not see anybody. The white girl, the one who talked to me. Yes, no, have you lost your mind completely? Nobody talked to you. You are seeing things. But the, the woman who whispered to me. Woman? <laughs> Just a group of natives and a tame panther. <laughs> You've quite an eye for women, Michelle. But you missed this one. And I'm to see her again. Tonight at midnight. And so it was that night when the moon was yellow in the sky. Gaston sneaked away from camp and walked down the street, walked to the end of the mud-banked road. He saw the girl standing under the palms, and his pulse quickened. But blended with that quickening was something more, something of fear, something in her eyes, in those cold, placid yellow eyes, something that seemed to swim under the lips. You've come at last. I was worried, my friend. What is your name? Gaston Monet, and yours? Mignon Alwa. Why do you look at me that way? Oh, you're the first decent thing I've seen in months. <laughs> Am I? Tell me, why did you ask me, out of all of the others, to, to meet you here tonight? I mean, it is strange, isn't it? Perhaps it is fate. And besides, I am in trouble. I'm stranded here. I set out on an expedition with some friends. Friends? Yes, friends from France. We were attacked and they were killed. The natives won't leave the village. You know that. And I can't stand it here any longer. But, but how can I help you? You are brave and strong. You could take me to a coastal city and then I could sail for France. For civilization. But, but I can't desert my outfit and just leave uh, suddenly into the desert. Besides, we, we have no provisions. I have provisions. I've saved them for a long time waiting for just such a one as you. And the journey is simple. Due east, four days' march. I, I should like to help you very much in any, any way I can, but... Oh, confound it, that's desertion. I, I just can't, woman. If you leave me here now, I will die. I will die in this place. Gaston, please. Gaston, don't refuse me. Please don't. It was warm out that evening. Warm. And the desert moon plays tricks with a man's mind. And the girl Mignon was more important to Gaston then than his country, his army, or his friends. And so they left together in the dead of the night. They stole out of De La Heba into the desert, into the lonely desert, with just enough provisions to make their way to the coast. And so the night passed and turned into morning, and that day passed and turned into another, 
And back in the village of Delaheba, Lieutenant Michel reported Monet's absence to Major Duval. The alarm was given, and the barracks were searched. And the search was fruitless. Lieutenant Michel reporting, sir. Yes, Lieutenant. The entire city has been searched, sir, but not a sign of him. I'm afraid, sir, it is desertion. I thought so. Because someone there never was army material. Weak. He'll never get away. We should let him die in that desert. Please, sir. Not out there. The sandstorms, they have started, sir. Oh, forget him. Blast these young men who joined the foreign service and expect it to be a picnic. What do they think war is? I quite agree, sir. They desert and then they expect me to send out a searching party to look for them. Well, they're right. I'll have to. You, Michel, choose four men, get your provisions from headquarters and start toward the coast. Try to head him off. You can reach the coast before he does. Where will we rejoin you, sir? Orders will be waiting for you on the coast. That's all, Lieutenant Michel. Thank you, sir. And so the search party started under the leadership of Lieutenant Michel. But Gaston Monet and Mignon were miles ahead of them. Camping for the night under the yellow moon, completely unaware that they were being followed, Gaston looked at the girl and breathed in the magic air of the desert. I dreamt of people like you, Mignon. And in my arms they came from nowhere. Just as you came from nowhere. Are you trying to pry into my secrets again? <laughs> no. No, I... I was just looking at you. You are so incredibly lovely. Oh, I'm glad. Mignon, we're about three days' march from the sea. We're only two days away from another native village. I could get work there, and... and we could get married. Married? Nonsense. And... and settle down. We'd be there five years or so, and then we'd return to France. The army would have forgotten about me by then, and I'd get a good job. I'd make you proud of me. Being buried out here for another five years, honestly, Gaston. But you wouldn't be buried. You'd be with me, just the two of us together. I'm... I'm frightfully in love with you. If you loved me, you wouldn't treat me the way you do. If I loved you, I probably wouldn't. But... but you... you chose me out of all the others. Yes, I chose you. And now, if you don't mind, let's get some sleep. We're going to be on the march tomorrow morning early. Sleep and march. Sleep and march. Three more days and then... Then give myself up to the authorities. You'll probably spend a few days in the guardhouse. Nothing more for this little adventure. Stop dramatizing yourself. The army calls it desertion, Mignon. There's only one punishment for desertion. What is that? You know very well what it is. Death. You got away once, you'll get away again. Don't you care what happens to me? Yes, of course I care, but what can I do? <gasps> what is that? Oh, a desert lion. Don't worry. He won't come near us, not while the fire is going. Fortunately, a beast is afraid of fire. But a woman loves it. <sighs> Good night, Gaston. Good night. Mignon. Well, such a hurt way to say goodnight. <laughs> and so they slept by the fire, and the fire played tricks with the shadows on the sand as they slept. But crouched not far from them was the panther, eyeing the boy and the girl, and it crept toward the fire unafraid, sidling up to the boy until its large yellow head was a foot from Gaston's arm. And it too fell asleep, and the fire died down. The morning sun rose over the sands, and they awoke, all three at once. Gaston, look, next to you. Where is my rifle? I, I've got it. <gasps> oh. Don't make any fast move, whatever you do, Mignon. Any sudden action will frighten the animal, and she'll spring on us. But we just can't sit here and wait. Move your left arm very slowly toward the rifle. Very slowly. And try to hand it to me. I wonder why she stands there looking at me like that. I wonder. She's coming closer. Sidling up to you like a great tabby. Here, I got the gun. I'll push it toward you. We can't shoot at this close range. She would never give me time to take aim. Look at her. Sitting right next to you. Yes. Why? She, she licked my arm. I believe she wants to make friends. What are you going to do? Pat her. I believe she'd allow me to. There. There you are. Oh, oh, watch out. You're a beautiful creature, aren't you? Beautiful lady. 
She's purring. Just like a great house cat. Yes. Yes, she likes it. I believe we've got a pet, Mignon. A pet, indeed. She'll purr at you now and turn on you at the first opportunity. Yes. Women and beasts are very much alike. They make friends of you and then they turn on you, don't they? You are not being funny, Gaston. I suppose you know that. Look. She's allowing me to play with her ears. What are we going to do with her? Nothing. Not now, at any rate. Just be careful not to frighten her. As soon as she goes any distance from us, I'll be able to take some kind of aim and shoot her. Yes, I suppose you're right. Look at her, Mignon. Do you notice anything? Nothing except she's a lovely specimen. Lovely, yes. Lovely. And she looks like you. But like me? That's sheer nonsense. Why? It's that... true. Look at her eyes. Yellow like yours. Deep like yours. Cruel and cold. Predatory like oh, yours. Just all I tell you, it's nonsense. Come over here, Mignon. Try to make a friend of her. What do you mean? I want you to pet her. Just as I'm doing. Well, of course, if she will let me. Try it. All right. I will. <laughs> oh, she, she snapped at me. Try it again. No, I... I'm afraid, Gaston. It's nice to see you afraid of something. I said try it again. No, 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 I, I, I won't. I said try it again. Did you hear me? <laughs> my arm. She bit my arm. It's bleeding. <laughs> she doesn't like you, Mignon. I wonder why. Watch. She'll allow me to stroke her. Please, Gaston, don't. Are you frightened, my dear? Why, this animal won't hurt you? Beautiful creature, aren't you? You don't like Mignon, do you? Or perhaps you do like her to test the sharpness of your claws. Don't, 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 don't joke about it, Gaston. You don't know what you're doing. You have no idea. You have no idea. Am I frightening you? Frightening me? <laughs> I have only one chance to be a woman, a real woman. A chance to go to a civilized country. A chance to break away from them. From the Panthers. From my brothers and sisters. Kill that animal or I must return to them. I lied to you before, Gaston. I lied to you when I said I came to Della Haber with an expedition. I was born here just as she was born here. And there is a kinship between us. Yes, that kinship you will never understand. Please, just don't kill that me! Blazing sun, Mignon begged Gaston to kill the panther. But Gaston insisted that all three travel toward the coast together. Why, he never knew. It was as if some power stronger than himself forced him on. The beautifully sleek creature followed behind Gaston and the girl, at times coming up to rub her fine, sleek body against his leg and growl, baring her fangs at the girl. When night began to creep over the sands like some monstrous dark hand, they stopped not far from an oasis. We'll make camp here, Mignon. Yes, here. Here in the desert. I'm so tired, Gaston. Are you? Poor little girl. How about you, beautiful lady? You'd better spread out the blankets and the food. I'll get some water. Oh, don't leave me alone with her, please, Gaston. She won't hurt you if you leave her alone. Oh, you don't know what you're saying. I'll be back directly. The water's only some half mile away. Call for help Gaston, if you need any. Gaston, please, please, Gaston. What are you afraid of? I said I'd be right back and the animal might follow me. But she's not following you. She's staying still, here. still, she won't hurt you. You've got the gun just in case. Gaston, please. Don't tease me. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I like to see you frightened, Mignon. You who are so sure of yourself. I'll be back directly. Nice little lady. Lie still. Let me point the gun. This won't hurt you. Why do you look at me like that? Yes, Gaston is right. 
We are alike. Our eyes, our souls, and our emotions. No, little lady, stay where you are until I get an aim. A perfect aim. No, no, no! Mignon, back, lady, back. Leave her alone, lady. I said leave Mignon alone. That's a good girl. There, beautiful lady. Mignon. Don't let me die here. You were a fool, Mignon, a fool. She wouldn't have hurt you if you hadn't tried to shoot her. I was frightened of her. I was so frightened. Yes, yes, She's so like me, and she, she knows it. She not only wanted to. Kill me. She wanted more. She wanted to absorb a human soul in that animal body. My soul. Try to lie still. Quietly, my dear, quietly. Look at her. Waiting for me. Watching and waiting. Waiting for me to die. Yes. <laughs> quiet, my dear, quiet. Lie still if you can. Lie still. It was such a short time. To be given a human life. That's why I was so anxious to get away from the desert. <laughs> you don't believe me. Gaston. You will. You will. Mignon. Mignon. <laughs> Little lady. You. You killed her. And I'll kill you. Yes, kill you for taking the only thing I love. Yes, I'll kill you. <laughs> Mignon. Mignon, where are you? But you're dead. You're dead, aren't you? But I heard you laugh. Or was it the panther? Mignon. Your laugh came from the throat of a panther. Can it be the blending of two souls? The soul of a woman and a beast. If, if I kill the panther, then I kill you. For you live in her, little lady. And you are Mignon. Mignon. Come over here. Come over here, my darling. Yes, Mignon. Now I never have to return to the coast. I'll return to the little native village and you'll be my pet. You'll never leave me now, will you? Will you, Mignon? My beautiful creature. You're wounded, aren't you? A bullet through your shoulder. Will you let me fix it? There. Lie still, Mignon. It won't hurt you much. It's just a flesh wound in your shoulder. There. Take out my pocket knife. And a little water. No, no, beautiful lady, it won't hurt. It won't hurt at all. Just another minute and... There you are. It's a nice, clean wound. How does that feel, beautiful lady? How does that feel? And now... This shell of a woman which was once... The soul of Mignon... Must be buried. A decent burial. Here in the burning sand. And so it was. The panther lay lazily in the sun while Gaston dug a sandy grave for the body that had been Mignon and placed her in it. The sun slowly set in the orange desert and the panther waited sleepily for him. And not many miles back, the search party plodded on in the cool winds over the great rises of sand mountains. Lieutenant Michel and Trooper Jacques walked ahead. Come along, men. I know you are tired, but we will soon catch up with him. How do you know, Lieutenant Michel? He might be gone ten different directions. If we miss him out here, we will catch him on the coast. Jacques, there is only one route to the coast. And that is the east. And that is the way he will go. Uh, don't you think he knows we're searching for him, sir? He left in too much of a hurry. He probably did not think about anything. Yeah. I always thought Gaston liked the army. Jacques, you can never tell what a man is thinking. I always say, cherchez la femme, Lieutenant. You cannot very well cherchez la femme. When there is not a woman within 30 to 40 miles of Jalaheba. You don't know Gaston Monet, sir. Stop talking nonsense. You sound like you know more than you're saying, Lieutenant. Maybe I do, and maybe I don't. Tell me, Jacques. 
You made a complete search of Delaweba. Was there any record of a white woman living there? No, sir. Nobody ever seen a white woman in Delaweba. Well, was anybody else reported missing from the village? No, nobody. Just a pet panther that one of the natives owned. A pet panther? Huh. I wonder. I really wonder. And well, he could wonder. For miles ahead of him, tracking off to another native village, Gaston Monet and the sleek panther trekked through the sand, retracing their steps to a halfway mark, heading away from the coast, away from a world of civilization. And the fourth day of the journey was almost at an end, and provisions were scarce. Mignon! Mignon! We must make camp again. The sun is setting, and night comes fast over the desert. We've only a little fruit left. You're hungry, aren't you? Well, beautiful lady, here you are. How is that? It's all so strange. You and Mignon. Mignon, what were you really? Where did you come from? What happened to that peculiar, distorted mind of yours? So much the beast. So very much a woman. <laughs> are you laughing at me now? Yes, yes, I don't blame you. It is funny loving you so much. Loving you and your being so very far away and yet so close. Are you content now, darling? Content to stay with me forever? Please, please be content. Try hard to find happiness. You would never have been happy in France or in any other part of the world. And I'll take care of you the rest of your days. What is that? Another panther? Is that one of your kinsmen? Mignon. Mignon, you can't leave me, little lady. Please. Please, I'd take care of you. Don't leave me. Please don't leave me. I'll kill you if you leave me. You can't leave me. No, no. Come here. I'll hold you here. And you'll never get away. You won't leave me. Mignon. Mignon, don't pull away like that. Oh! Your teeth are sharp. Don't. Don't. Where? Where's my knife? Where is it? Oh, here it is. No. No, I told you I'd kill you if you tried. And I will. I will. There. The knife. There. Darling, darling Mignon, this is your release. Yes, your release. Please come back to me. Please come back to me. Don't leave me alone at the desert. Oh, Mignon. Mignon. You'll never go back to your panther friend. Never, darling. Never. Never. And the blood flowed freely from the wounded beast's heart, staining the yellow sands crimson. And Gaston turned toward the fading sun, his face streaked by tears, stained by sand. And walking away from the beast, he looked toward the sky. Then, falling face forward on the sand, he lay under the hot desert sun. Toward evening, as the sun set in the sky, the four-man searching party reached the blood-stained sand. And then... Lieutenant Michel, look. Eh? The panther, dead. A body covered with knife wounds. Look behind him. Gaston. Gaston! Oh, it's no use, sir. Gaston Monet's been dead for well over 12 hours. Dead? The panther's body covered with knife wounds. And Gaston's body absolutely unharmed. Funny, ain't it? Not too funny. I wonder if that's the pet panther that disappeared. Probably. Jacques, never mention that in the report to Major Duval. Just write, desertion. Due to insanity. Insanity, sir? Yes, Jacques. Insanity. Caused by desert madness. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought again the immortal tale, A Passion in the Desert. Bellkeeper, hold the bell.
Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? Nita, what is it? What's wrong with you? I don't know. All of a sudden, I, I got a terrible feeling. A horrible feeling of, of foreboding. I'm frightened, Tom. Another Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the unusual story of malice. Dr. Jacob Benton is the wealthiest citizen in a certain upstate county, as well as its most prominent physician and surgeon. Jacob Benton is a proud individual proud of the fact that he comes from a long line of highly successful surgeons, and his greatest ambition is that his son, Tom, will follow in his footsteps and carry on the family tradition. Jacob has also a nephew, Harvey, son of Jacob's scapegoat brother who married a girl from the wrong side of the town and finally disappeared, leaving Jacob to take care of his young son. After finishing high school, Tom and Harvey entered medical school. Harvey followed through and is to graduate next week. But Jacob's son, Tom, at the end of his third year, wandered over to the East Bottoms at the lower end of town and uh, met a girl, lost interest in medicine, and refused to go back to school. Tom. Tom. Yes, Father? Come into the library. What do you want? Where have you been? It's two in the morning. Why, I've been to a party. Where? A house party. On the other side of town? Yes. In the East Bottoms. You've seen that girl, that Nita, again, haven't you? Yes. What of it? What of it? You're a disgrace to the name of Benton. I've told you time and again that you don't belong over there. I like Nita because she's honest and genuine. She's not filled with a lot of silly ideas like Eloise. Eloise is a fine girl. She belongs to an excellent family. Oh, bosh. Eloise is a phony. Nita's a real fellow. If you become serious about this girl, you'll be ostracized. I know. I know all about poor Uncle George. He went over to the East Bottoms and met a girl and went to the dogs. But it wasn't the girl. He was no good in the first place. He was a stubborn fool, just like you. I resent being told who and when and where. Are you in love with this girl? Yes. I'm terribly disappointed in you, Tom. I'd hoped, I'd prayed that you'd become a surgeon. I don't like medicine. You were wrapped up in your studies until you met this girl. That's what you think. I'm ashamed of you. Your cousin Harvey came from the lower end of town. I made him see the light. And then think of it. You about face and walk right into it. You quit school and he graduates next week. All right, his name's Benton, too. Let him carry on. He likes medicine. It bores me. This girl has made a fool of you. Oh, I could kill her. I think I'd better go to bed. 
Good night. Good night. Young idiot. He's going to finish school if I have to... What's all the racket about down here? Oh, uh, come in, Harvey. I... I heard voices. Yes, it was Tom. He's been to a party across town. Been out with that cheap girl again, that Nita. Are you sure? He admitted it. Says he's in love with her. Tossing his career to the winds over a woman like that. How long has he been seeing her? Oh, several months, I suppose. That's why he wouldn't go back to school. All she's after is his money. How he ever met up with her, I'll never know. I'm afraid I'm the cause of that, Uncle Jacob. You? What do you mean? Well, when I was home last summer, I went over there one evening, several evenings, in fact. Tom insisted on going along. I wanted to see some of the kids. I went to school with Nita, and, well, I introduced them. Well, of all things, you were born over there, and if you insisted on going back, it was your own business. But Tom is my son. You knew how I felt about it. You had no right to take him over there. I realize that now. Well, something's got to be done about it at once. Yes, but what? I'll put an end to it. Believe me, I'll find a way and I'll stop at nothing. For the remainder of the night, Jacob sits in the library studying the problem of what to do about Tom. And upstairs, young Harvey paces to and fro, pondering over the same question. The next morning, Harvey goes to the lower end of town to visit Nita. Hello, Nita. Harvey. Why, I didn't know you were back in town. You didn't? I came home last night. I'm going back in a few days for graduation exercises. Have you missed me, Nita? Why, why, Yes. Why haven't you written me in the last month or so? Well, I, I've been busy. Been across town lately? No, why should I? Mm-hmm. You know, it's a strange thing about this section called the East Bottoms. It means more than just a, a place. It's a huge barrier, an insurmountable obstacle. I was born over here, same as you. But I got an idea that I could cross over, and in time I'd be accepted as one of them. But I finally realized that I would never be accepted. I'd only be tolerated. I'd never be able to practice medicine over there. I think that's all imagination. I told you I had definitely decided to come back here and settle down. That's why I asked you to marry me. I'm not satisfied here. Since when? I've never been satisfied here. You belong here, Nita. You'll never be able to cross over. You'd be miserable. I know. Maybe. And... Tom would never last over here. He'd wash up, just as my father did. What are you talking about? I know what's happened. You're throwing me over for Tom. What? You're after Tom because you think he'll take you out of this. Set you up on the other side. Well, he won't. You'll have to come over here, and he won't have a dime. You're not really in love with Tom. I am in love with him, and he loves it me. It won't last a month. I'll make it last. Oh, don't be a fool, Nita. Tom's father thinks you're a... Uh, good for nothing. And he'll never change. I don't care. I love Tom. And when it came to a showdown, Tom would walk out on I'm him. I'm going to marry him. I've made up my mind. Then there's nothing more I can say. Goodbye, Nita. Goodbye. <laughs> That evening, Dr. Jacob comes to a decision, and he too crosses town and makes his way to Nita's apartment. Well, what do you want to talk about, Dr. Benton? About my son, Tom. I see. How long have you known him? Oh, since last summer. Have you seen him often? Yes, several times a week for the last two months. You think you're in love with him? I don't think. I know I am. I don't think he's in love with you. He's merely infatuated. You're interested in his position, his money. You can think whatever you like. I'm familiar with your type. My... my type? What's the matter with me? Are you aware of what you're doing to my son? I've done nothing, nothing at all. You've caused him to drop his career. Tom has a tradition to fulfill. He comes from a fine family. And I won't have him throw it all to the wind because of a silly infatuation. It isn't an infatuation. He must marry someone in his own class. Someone who'll inspire him to carry on his career. I didn't talk him out of his career. He says he doesn't like medicine. The right girl wouldn't allow him to stray. She would encourage him to follow through. The right girl. Family. Tradition. It's all a lot of bosh. 
Everybody in this town has made up his mind that the East Bottoms mean the difference between somebody and nobody. Well, I haven't. I'm made of the same stuff as you or Tom or anybody else over there. I've a right to a decent existence. If it's money you want, I'll give you money to let him alone. I'll give you a lot more than you'll ever get from Tom if you marry him. Money? You... You'd pay me to give him up? Yes. Here. Here's a check for $5,000. $5,000? Is that all your son is worth to you? $5,000? If he were my son, and I thought I could buy his future, I'd give every cent I had. What? You mean you want more than that? Dr. Benton... You don't possess enough money to buy me off. I don't want money. Well, what goes on here? Hello, Tom. Came just in time. What are you doing here, Father? What do you suppose? What's he been saying, Nita? He just gave me this check for $5,000. For what? To let you alone, so you can continue your career. What? He thinks I'm wrecking your life. He is. That settles it. We'll get married tonight. You won't get married tonight, not in this state. We'll fly over to the island. That's in another state. They don't have the three-day law. Get your things, Nita. If you marry this girl, I'll never give you another cent. I'll get along. Come on, Nita. Tom, I'll stop at nothing to break this up. I promise you'll regret this moment so long as you live. Let's go, Nita. So Tom and Nita rush out of the house and drive to the airport just outside of town. A storm has come up. The highway glistens in the beam of the headlights. This rain is certainly like a cloudburst. Maybe we shouldn't fly over tonight, Tom. Why not? I don't like to fly in a storm. How, how can you tell where to land? Oh, don't worry about that. I'm familiar with the field. Who's on the island at this time of year? Well, not many people. We've had this summer place there as long as I can remember. There's an old fellow and his wife who look after most of the places. He's also a justice of the peace. He can marry us, we'll spend the night at our place, and then we'll go someplace else tomorrow. Tom, are you sure you want to go through with this? Certainly. What do you ask? Your father meant what he said. Is it... is it worth it to give up everything? You're worth a dozen family fortunes. But, but now that I think about it, it... it... Well, he sort of frightened me. <laughs> he didn't frighten me. Oh, the way he said it made... made chills run up my spine. Said what? You'll regret this moment so long as you live. Oh, he was just bluffing. But somehow, I, I don't think he was. He can cut me off, but we'll get along. Tom, why don't you finish your studies? I told you, darling. I don't like medicine, and I never will. Why should I do something I dislike just because my father and my great-great-grandfathers liked it? Well, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. But I'll find something. Yes? What is it? <laughs> Nita. What is it? What's wrong with you? Oh, I, I don't know. All of a sudden, I've got a terrible feeling. A feeling of... of foreboding. Oh, snap out of it, Nita. This isn't like you. I know, but I can't help it. I, I'm frightened. Of what? I don't know, but I am. Oh, tell me to turn back. Let's wait, please. Oh, no, you can't back out now. We're going through with this. But he meant it. Your father meant what he said. I know he did. Please turn back. I wouldn't turn back for all the money in the world. Oh, Tom, I can't see a thing. No lights, nothing. Now, don't worry. I don't need lights to land. We should have come in a boat. No, it's too choppy for a boat. This is the only way in weather like this. Tom, there, I see a light. Just went on. Yeah? Old Jenkins probably heard it. The, the light is swinging. Yeah, that's it. That's the field. It's a tiny one, but I can make it. There's a light. Yeah. We're all right now. Hang on. I'm going to set her down. Tom! Tom, look out those trees! Pull up! Dead, Pa. I don't know yet. Good thing it didn't catch fire. Oh, who are they? No, no. 
Hold the lantern down here. It's a woman. Uh, don't recognize her. Hey, hey, this is young Tom Benton. Oh, the girl is hurt bad. Look at her legs. They must be broken. Yeah. Come along. We can get him over to the house. Phone Doc Benton. <laughs> Hello, this Dr. Benton's home. Uh, this is Jenkins over on the island. Is Dr. Benton there? Oh, is that you, Harvey? Well, you better find Doc and get him over here right away. It's young Tom. He tried to land his plane hit some trees. Uh, I don't think Tom is hurt so bad, but the girl has smashed up something terrible. I don't know who she is. Yeah, Goodbye. <laughs> Well, it didn't take you long to get here, Harvey. We've got him over at our place. How in the world did Tom hit those trees? I had no trouble seeing the field. The lights weren't on when Tom came in. Didn't even hear his motor until it was too late. He should have phoned me. He was coming. Hey, where's Doc Benton? You got on the case. He left his patient's house, so I, I left a message telling him I was going ahead and to come as quickly as possible. I brought some medical supplies. Here we are. Tom's over there on the couch. They put the girl in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. A few, few cuts on him. Don't think he has any broken bones. Oh, nasty bump on the head. Maybe a slight concussion. Well, I better have a look at the girl. Looks to me like both her legs are broken. Nita. Oh, poor kid. You know who she is? Yes. Yes, I know who she is. Uh, was I right about her legs? Yes. Both rather badly smashed up. Where were they going on a night like this? I imagine they came over here to get you to marry them. Marry them? Well, I'll be darned. I wonder why they didn't phone me first. They were in too much of a hurry, I suppose. Too bad. She's in a very critical condition. Extreme shock. Better get some hot water and plenty of blankets. Yeah, right away. Get the house as warm as possible and put more blankets on Tom. I'll be right back. Martha? Uh, yes? How is she? Harvey says she's in bad shape. Gather up all the bedclothes and coats you can. Got to cover them up good. Put on plenty of water to heat. I'll build up the fire. Outside, the storm rages on. Harvey sits quietly beside Nita's bed, staring at her in a daze. Her breathing becomes shallow, irregular. A quarter of an hour passes. Then a plane motor is heard overhead. The ship sets down, and Dr. Jacob hurries to the house. Tom's over there, Doc. Tom. Tom... He, he's been unconscious ever since we brought him in. Can't find any fractures. He's got an awful wallop on his head. Yes. I see. Hmm. No apparent concussion. He'll be all right in a short while. Um, get some pillows. Raise his feet. I want his head lower. I'll get them. You certainly got it hot in here. Yeah. Um, Harvey had us do that... Because of the girl. She's pretty bad. Girl? Where is the girl? Oh, in the bedroom there. Harvey's in there. Um, I'll have a look at her. Harvey. Harvey. Huh? Oh. Hello, Uncle. What's the matter with you? Uh, I just... Are you crying? No, no, I... I I'm just... This is a miserable mess. Fine example of a doctor you are. You have to learn to be completely impersonal about these things. Oh, I know. What do you say is wrong with her? Both legs are broken. She's suffering from extreme shock. Uh-huh. Better take your bag. Go out there and give Tom a shot of adrenaline. 
I'll attend to the girl. Yes, sir. Harvey gives Tom the adrenaline and proceeds to attend to the cuts and bruises. Then he moves to the fireplace and sits staring into the blaze. The storm rages on. The minutes drag slowly along. Ten, twenty, thirty. Then Dr. Jacob steps out of the bedroom. Harvey. Yes, sir? Has Tom come out of it yet? Not yet. But he shows improvement. He'll be all right in a little while. I see. Jenkins. Yes, Doc? Get us something to make a pallet. We'll carry him down to the plane take him over to the hospital. Sure, right away. I'll get four poles and some rope. I'll have two made in a jiffy. Never mind two, just one. The girl is dead. Then on the following day, Tom has fully recovered. Gradually, the events of the preceding hours begin to pass before him. The argument, the island, the plane... Nita. Nita screaming, and then the crash. And then... Nita. Nita. Where is Nita? Tom sends for his father. But Jacob is already standing in the shadows of the room. How do you feel, Tom? Nita. Is Nita all right? Now, now, take it easy, Tom. Don't get excited. Where is Nita? Forget about Nita for the moment. You've been pretty badly banged up. A little more, and you'd have had a real concussion. What about Nita? If you insisted on flying to the island, why didn't you phone Jenkins to turn on the light? He heard my motor. We were in a hurry. Besides, I saw the lights. Jenkins said he didn't turn them on at all. Didn't hear you until just before you crashed. That's ridiculous. Where have you got Nita? Nita is at the undertaker's. She... What? She's dead. Good Lord. Was she... Did it happen in the crash? No, she died about half an hour after I got there. Were you on the island? Yes, Jenkins found you and called the house. I was out on a case and got to the island too late to save her. What was the cause? Her legs were broken. She died from extreme shock. Was there nothing you could do? Nothing. Did you try? I resent that inference. You should know better than that. I'd rather have had anybody in the world there than you... Do you know what you're talking about? Yes, I do. You hated her. You didn't give her half a chance. Will you shut up and stop yelling? What did you give her? I gave her adrenaline. It was probably water. I've heard enough out of you. When you come to your senses, I'll consider talking to you. Good day. Now Tom, his mind filled with suspicion, his heart burning with hatred throws on his clothes, dashes out of the hospital and goes to the island. He reviews the whole situation with Jenkins. Each incident from the time he first heard the plane motor to the moment they took him to the hospital. Tom returns to town, arranges for an autopsy, and is now talking to the autopsy surgeon. Well, Dr. Groberg, how about it? What's your report? Well, both legs were fractured. But there was no compound fracture. There were several minor lacerations about the body and the head contusion. Nothing there that would have caused death? No, no, nothing. What else did you find? Any evidence of of poison? No, none. She was suffering from shock? Oh, naturally. But uh, not extreme shock. Then, Then she didn't die from shock. Death from shock would have been prevented by the adrenaline administered. Then you found adrenaline present? Yes. That is what I can't understand. What do you mean? Well, one of the most difficult things to diagnose is the difference between extreme shock and internal hemorrhage. There was internal hemorrhage? Certainly. And this one was one of the easiest to diagnose I've ever seen. As you well know, adrenaline in internal hemorrhage is absolutely contraindicated. In other words, you think our death was caused by the administration of adrenaline? I do, definitely. But those things happen sometimes, regardless of how hard we try. Yes. Well, thanks, Doctor. I'll see you later. Hello, Father. 
Well, have you finally come to your senses? Yes. Yes, I have. I'd like to have a little talk with you. Very well. What about? I've been doing a little investigating. Investigating? Now, what are you talking about? I'm talking about Nita. Are you going to start on that again? I am. And I'm going to follow it to a conclusion. I don't want to have anything more to do with it. But I do. I've had a hard day, and I don't care to listen to any more of your idiotic babblings. How would you like to have the grand old name of Benton? The untarnished reputation of your long line of surgeons blasted to a thousand pieces. What are you talking about? How would you like to have it known that you, the eminent Dr. Benton, the trusted, the revered Dr. Jacob Benton, deliberately and with malice of forethought, caused the death of a girl... How would you like that? You're insane, positively mad. Oh, no, I'm not. I've gone back over the whole thing. I know you hated Nita. You said I'd regret the day so long as I lived. You threatened to do something, and you did. At your first opportunity... You are crazy. You did everything to separate us. You tried to buy her off. When that didn't work, you killed her. Get out of here. Leave this house. You didn't just let her die. You killed her, murdered her. Get out... I know what I'm talking about. I had an autopsy performed. You what? An autopsy. Go on. She didn't die of shock. What then? She died of a very obvious internal hemorrhage, aggravated by adrenaline, which is contraindicated. You're a specialist in that line. You couldn't have made that mistake in a thousand years. But I was positive it was shock. You knew what it was. No, I I must have been wrought up. I, I could have made that one wrong diagnosis that happens once in a thousand times. Oh, no, I saw the body. I could tell, with as little medical experience as I've had. Tom, you... You mustn't say anything further about this. Why not? It would ruin my reputation. Oh, now you're worried about your reputation. What's that compared to the girl I love? Oh, but Tom, listen to me, please. Good night. Wait a minute. Wait, Tom. Well, what do you want, Harvey? I heard you. I heard every word. So what? I can't let it go on like this. I can't let you do this to your father. What's it to you? You keep out of no, it. No, Tom, now listen. You're wrong. I know what I'm talking about. Nita was murdered, and I can prove it. Your father had nothing to do with it. Harvey, that's enough. Leave us alone. I won't. I can't stand by quietly and see this happen to you. I won't. Leave this room, Harvey. Don't say another word. Wait a minute. What are you trying to say, Harvey? I did it. Your father's trying to cover up for me. What do you mean? He wants to save my future reputation. If it got out, it, it would be a blot against me. What would be? When Jenkins called, your father was out. He told me what had happened. I left a note for your father. Took an emergency bag... And flew to the island and... in hopes I could do something. Go on. I... I thought Nita was suffering from shock. I, I was terribly upset because... because I was in love with her. So I gave her adrenaline. I wasn't experienced enough to recognize symptoms of hemorrhage. Is that the truth? Yes, now that he's told it, there's nothing I can do. I knew in an instant it was hemorrhage. When I saw the adrenaline vial, I knew what a terrible mistake he'd made. He was emotionally upset over the girl, and I wanted to give him a chance. It was done. I tried my best to pull her through, but it was too late. I'm sorry, Tom. Terribly sorry. Harvey guiltily leaves the library and goes up the stairs to his room. Tom stands staring at Jacob, then drops into a chair and begins to sob softly. A few minutes pass, then... A shot. Tom and his father leap to their feet, rush up the stairs and into Harvey's room. Harvey is sprawled dead over the desk, a gun in his hand. And on the desk, a note addressed to Tom. Read it, Tom. Dear Tom, I can't stand it any longer. It's been driving me crazy from the moment I did it. Nita's face is before me every second of the day and night. I was in in love with her. But when she ran away with you, I lost my reason. I imagined she'd be better off dead. I was filled with hatred. I knew she was suffering from hemorrhage. But I gave her the adrenaline in a bit of revenge. Now it's driving me mad. Forgive me. Harvey. Well... That's the end. Another case of jealousy. Another example of the futility of allowing oneself to become a victim of the green-eyed monster, jealousy. C. 
CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next Sunday, 9.15... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. (laughs) Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. When Mike left his latest trucking student at the terminal, he knew that Dave was not truly gone. The smell would take a lot longer to get out of his truck's cabin. What Mike didn't know, though, is that the odor wasn't the only thing that Dave left behind. Bedbugs by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Strange Wills Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William And featuring Loreen Tuttle and Carlton Young With Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast Original music by Del Castillo I devise and bequeath to my heirs The seven deadly sins Greed, despair, envy, hate, jealousy, pride, and anger. And here is Warren William. These are the stories about strange wills and the secret lives of the even stranger people who made them. Time, places, and names have all been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons, living or dead. Only the sin remains. Remains like a shrouded ghost of the dead departed, offering neither understanding nor solution. You'll presently see what I mean, but first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now here is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Seven Flights to Glory. Everybody in town knew Lucy Witherspoon. She not only was a leader in the charmed 400 circle, but had more than doubled her deceased husband's fortune during the ten years that she had taken over the actual management of his sprawling industrial empire. But even Lucy was not immune to the call of the Black Angel of Death. All her doctors, all of her power, could not keep Lucy Witherspoon in the land of the living. And when she finally realized that death was but a matter of days, she called me to her country estate to help put her affairs in order. Now see here, John Francis O'Connell. I want no high-sounding platitudes or advice on how I am to distribute my estate. After all, I own it, not you. That's the trouble with you lawyers. You think you know everything. 
when you don't. <laughs> Lucy Witherspoon, the years haven't softened you a bit, have they? You're still as tart as a glass of, well, crab apple jelly. I'm not trying to... Don't try to fool me. I know what you're up to. You want me to leave my entire estate to my son, Robert, now don't you? Don't tell me you don't. Of course I do, Lucy. That's no secret. He's your only child and a fine young man. Oh, fine young man, fiddlesticks. How many times have I tried to get him interested in my business? Now, you know, you know, don't try and say that you yes, don't. Yes, yes, Lucy, I know. Time without end. And you've never succeeded. And do you know why? Yes, yes, I know why, John. <laughs> because Robert Witherspoon would rather waste his time painting pictures. He wants to be an artist. <laughs> my son, an artist. <laughs> and you know, too, John, that I've always been opposed to such nonsense. For five generations, the Witherspoons have been industrialists. And now I have a paintbrush dauber to carry on in the Witherspoon tradition. Ah. Yes, now but... Now, you listen to me. Listen to me. I'll have no more words. This is the way I want it to be. And this is the way it shall be. My entire estate to Robert Witherspoon, if he will assume full management and responsibility of my business for a period of 15 years. You understand? Yes, Lucy. I have an alternative that he can accept if he should prefer. Should my son decide not to accept the responsibilities of honest work, and should he persist in painting a pretty girl or some silly mountain rather than building an industrial empire, well, then I will give him the sum of $5,000. And a ticket to Paris. Yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Five thousand dollars. And a ticket to Paris. <laughs> 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 Hello, Bob. Come in. Hello, darling. How have you been? Well, I was a little worried. I thought you'd never get here. I'm sorry. I've been in my attorney's apartment on important business. Oh, and how is our good friend John O'Connell? Not so happy. You see, Kay, since Mother's death, I've given three months of careful thinking to the two provisions in her will, and, well, I've decided against taking over the management of Mother's business affairs. Decided? Oh, but, Bob... Let me finish, please, darling. Kay, dear, I want to be an artist more than anything in life. I have a different sense of worldly values than Mother. I, I want to create. I, I simply have to. And so, well, I'm here tonight to beg you to come to Paris with me, struggle with me, and if necessary, starve with me. Oh, Bob, really? You're joking. I was never more serious in my life. Kay, I'm taking the $5,000 Mother left me and the ticket to Paris. I'm renouncing everything else. Now, won't you come with me? Life will be so wonderful, Kay, something I've always dreamed of. A studio on the left bank, and oh. an artist colony with flower stands and bookstalls sprawling along the Seine, and then the Louvre, the, the famous churches. Okay, oh, there's only one Paris in the whole world. Bob, I, I think you've lost your power of reason. You would give up a fortune of millions, honor and position, to live the life of a vagrant artist. And you expect me to give up my social position? My family and my friends to starve with you? Well... I shan't do it. If you're the fool I never believed you to be, go right ahead. But if you do go, remember this. I'll break our engagement, definitely. I see, Catherine. That old tradition, like father, like son. That's exactly how I feel, Robert. Like father, like son. There are no two ways about it. Either you assume the responsibilities your mother left behind... Or... I'm sorry, Kay. I'm very sorry, because I love you very much. But if, it, but if it's either or, then I take Paris. It's no use, Bob. She won't be here to see you off. 
Well, John, I sort of thought that she could at least have come down to the boat to say goodbye. Oh, don't you understand, Bob? Catherine is bitter. You've cast off something that just isn't understandable to her. You've tipped over the apple cart of tradition. Yes, I know. I guess even she couldn't understand how I feel about being on my own. <laughs> Tossing over a fortune isn't done every day, is it? <laughs> no, it certainly isn't, Bob. But you've tossed over more than a fortune. You see, you've ended her dream of the merger of two great fortunes and families. Listen, John. You've been my mother's friend for many years, and mine too. Now tell me the truth. How do you feel about it? Am I the fool Catherine says I am? Yes, Bob. In my opinion, you are. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, wait, Bob. I'm not through. But if you are a fool, you're a glorious one. One that I envy with all my heart. Thanks, John. You, you've got me all filled up. I, I didn't... Go to it. Work like the very devil. And unless I miss my guess completely, within just a few years, you'll have a certain young lady awfully sorry that she didn't go on this glorious adventure with you. All ashore, what's going ashore? All ashore, what's going ashore? Well, goodbye, Bob. And remember, I know and understand. And when you need me... <laughs> I won't forget, John. And thank you. The next three years brought noteworthy events. The first was the fashionable church wedding of Catherine Whiting to the multimillionaire architect and man about town, Harrison Blake. The second incident was likewise of tremendous importance. All the papers carried the story. Robert Witherspoon, American artist residing in Paris, had won the Parisian Academy Award and had captured first prize with his picture called Chansonnet. And three months later, I received a long letter from Bob. He asked me to extend his congratulations to Catherine. He also told me that he had just married a young French girl, the model of his prize-winning picture. Her name was Germaine André. Two marriages and no compromise. One had followed tradition and had married wealth and security. The other had cast off wealth and security and had married his model. Well... <laughs> Things were really getting interesting. Almost a year later, I received a cablegram from Bob asking if I would fly over and attend his first exhibition in Paris. <laughs> you bet I would. I made arrangements to leave the following week. When my plane arrived, Bob was waiting to greet me. John! John, it's great to see you. And I'm most happy to be here, too, Bob. It's almost like a family reunion. But, uh, where's Jermaine? Let's get in one of these so-called cabs, John, and I'll tell you about it on the way home. Uh, taxi, taxi! Uh, Rue Campese, s'il vous plaît. Oui, monsieur. Oui. Now then, John, I'll tell you about Germaine. You see, when I married her, her greatest happiness came from the creation of something beautiful. She had no money. Her only income was from the few francs a day that she earned posing for the artists in the colony. To me, she represented an ideal. That man must live to create first and think of himself last. Well, as soon as I started making money, all that seemed to change. What do you mean? Well, Germaine tired of living a bohemian life. She wanted clothes, wealth, security, position. In fact, uh, outside of Catherine's belief in tradition, there wasn't any difference. No, I think that's quite understandable, Bob. And I still believe that there's a middle road for both of you and Germaine to follow. We'll talk about that later. Oh, by the way, as long as you brought up the subject of Catherine, I've got some interesting news about her. <laughs> I suppose she gave birth to an heir for her dynasty. <laughs> no, not that. Quite the contrary. She flew to Reno last week to file suit for divorce. Part two of Seven Flights to Glory will follow in just a moment.
And here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. As I climbed up the seven flights of stairs to Bob's studio, I wondered if this was the price of genius. Only one more flight, John. Don't give up. I shan't give up, but uh, but must you artists always pick out places like this? <laughs> Just wait. Just wait until you see it. Ah, here we are. Presenting the inner sanctum of art, my studio. Well, how do you like it? Well, it's... It's magnificent. What a wonderful view of Paris. Why, um, I could almost paint here myself. <laughs> I knew you'd like it, John. Look out over Paris. Chimney tops, flower boxes, slate roofs, dormer windows. And, you see, look way over there to the left. Ah, uh, Eiffel Tower. And where all of those trees line the street is the Champs-Élysées. And that, uh, that patch of green is the Bois de Boulogne. Yeah, it takes my breath away. <laughs> What's left of it? <laughs> <laughs> it's been my inspiration all through the years. Ah, John, how I love Paris. The happiest days of my life have been spent right here. I slept, painted, and ate right in this room until... Why did you ever leave this seventh heaven? I didn't want to, but Germain thought that uh, we should live in a more pretentious place and just keep this as a studio. I understand. Tradition rears its ugly head. Yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> security, tradition. <laughs> Oh, well, enough of this. Let's drive over to the galleries. Germain is over there supervising the hanging of the pictures, and uh, the exhibit opens tomorrow, you know, and, uh, well, keep your fingers crossed. And Germain, this is my very good friend, Monsieur O'Connell. John Francis O'Connell. Oh, I'm happy to know you, Monsieur O'Connell. You will pardon my appearance, oui? I've been very busy with the pictures. But now, voila, it is fini. Robert will make a lot of money from this exhibit. N'est-ce pas, chérie? Well, I, I hadn't thought of the money part, Germain. Ah, this pumpkin, Monsieur Connell, he never thinks of money, only the art. Oh, it's so difficult. That's what comes of being a real artist, perhaps, Germain. Real artist, oui. You find them by the dozen in the Latin court, and all of them starving to death. <laughs> I tell Robert that he should cultivate rich people and paint their portraits. <laughs> And he make much money for his baby. <laughs> ah, I want very, very much to take him to America after this exhibit is over. There are many rich millionaires there. Many would pay him much money. But, Germain, dear, that isn't what I want to be. I want to be an artist, not a leech. I've told you before, and I say it again. I'm going to stay right here in Paris and do the sort of thing I like, just as we did from the beginning. D don't you understand? Je ne comprends, Robert. I do not understand. We have starved long enough. We sell the pictures and go to America, no? No, dear, we stay in Paris. I believe if we stay in Paris, you shall stay alone. Joanne, you, you can't... Hey, excuse me, both of you, for intervening. But let's wait until the exhibit is over, and then I'm sure you can both compromise. I'm sorry, John. Terribly sorry. I... You will excuse me, monsieur. I have melated headache. Perhaps that is why I'm so disagreeable. Bonsoir, monsieur. Monsieur, Monsieur Connell, oh, it's wonderful, très magnifique. The exhibit is grand success. Already we have made two million francs and more pictures to be still sold. Now you shall see. I shall take Robert to America. He shall be a rich fellow. Now, I'm very, very unhappy indeed, Germain. His exhibit has really made him quite famous. All of the critics agree that Robert has a most brilliant future. Where is Bob? Oh, at his studio. Oh, Monsieur Connell, he has been such a bad boy. He's sulky, like, what you say, stubborn mules. He wants to stay in Paris and work and work. He never wants to have fun. It's not my province to interfere in your domestic problems, Charmaine. And I don't intend to do so. I only hope that uh, you both make the right decision. Bob is an artist, a real artist. I'd hate to have anything happen to have that. Have no fear, Monsieur. He can still be an artist in America, but he will have to learn that he must paint first to sell and then for the sake of art.
That night, Bob took me to his favorite rendezvous, a little Parisian nightclub in the Latin Quarter, which bore the dubious name of L'Amour Eternal. Eternal love, eh? I wondered about it as I went in the door. Oh, this is where you artists gather. I never would have suspected that you were so frivolous, young man. I used to have a lot of fun here once, John, when I was an inspiring artist. Now it's sort of turned to ashes in my mouth. The great illusion has ended. Oh, don't take it so hard, Bob. Tremaine has really done a lot for you. Once she was your inspiration. She modeled for your greatest picture, remember? Yes, I remember. Little Germain. A crust of bread, she asked for in those days. A crust of bread and a franc. And now it's angel food and a pocket full of diamonds. <laughs> well, lots of girls would do the same thing. Listen, John. The last time I saw Paris. I remember that last night I called on Kay. I was whistling, and as I walked up to her home, boy, was I in the clouds. Well, I suppose she's got her divorce by now. It's too bad. What's done's done, Bob. Wasn't it Omar Khayyam who said, the moving finger rights and having writ moves on? Nor all your piety and wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Very apropos. Nor all my tears wash out a word of it. Well, drink up, John. Champagne, the golden wine of forgetfulness. Here, let me fill your glass. Ah. Here's a toast. To Paris, the beautiful, the magnificent. And to your happiness, Bob. Yes, my happiness. It's sort of all bound up in that song. Yeah. No matter how they change her, I'll remember her that way. I left the next day for London to conclude my business affairs before returning to America. Quite frankly, I was worried over Bob's marital happiness. I felt sure that if Germain succeeded in bringing him to America, his great genius, his grand illusion, would shatter to bits. But what could I do? What could I possibly do to help him? A week later, the problem was solved without my help. Bob called me at my hotel. It'll never have to be the last time I saw Paris, John. I'm staying on right here in my studio. Well, you must have done some fast talking to Germain. You bet I did. It was easy. <laughs> that easy? Sure. She took the two million <laughs> francs from the art sale and gave me a divorce. She's sailing for America tomorrow. She said if I wouldn't paint portraits of the millionaires, that wouldn't stop her from meeting them. <laughs> I'll be through with my work here in about ten days, and then I'll fly back to see you before I go home. Chin up, Bob. I've got to start all over from scratch. All I need is another model. Uh, you better bring one back with you. <laughs> okay, Bob. I'll look around. All Bob needed was another model and a new inspiration. Well, I'd see what I could do. But it couldn't be a smash-through center. No, it had to be an end run. The situation called for some rockney deception. Two weeks later, I was back in Paris. I went immediately to the studio. Bob wasn't there, nor was he at his apartment. I searched the whole quarter for him and finally found him at a sidewalk cafe. He looked wretched. I'll get over it. I'll get over it. It's just that I... Ah, <laughs> Well, I know how you feel, Bob. Anyone would. I can't understand human nature. It's got me puzzled, John. Idealists today, money grabbers tomorrow. Boom goes their ideal. It's got me confused, utterly confused. Well, let's not worry about it for the present, Bob. Tell you what we'll do. Come over to my apartment at the hotel for a day or two. Forget your studio. Forget art. Just for a little while. Then come back to it with a new approach. Yeah, I wonder if I'll ever come back to it. It's like bitter wormwood tea. <laughs> it won't be hard to forget, believe me. Bob slept at my hotel the better part of the next two days. I came back to my apartment just as he was getting up. 
<laughs> John, I feel as though I've been sleeping for 20 years. <laughs> well, you practically have. This is Thursday, and you went to bed on Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> feel better? Like a new man. <laughs> Let's go out and have some breakfast. You mean lunch. It's almost 2 o'clock. Okay, lunch then. And after that, we'll ride over to your studio. I want to take one last look at the view before I leave. You're leaving? Oh, no, please don't go just when I... Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. I have to return to the States at once. I have some important legal work. Oh, of course, of course. It's selfish of me to ask. But don't worry. I think you'll get along all right. There's nothing been done that can't be undone. <laughs> This is the last time I'm going to walk up seven flights for a long time to come. Seven flights to glory. A little bit tarnished just now, but I still love it. As soon as you've found a new model, you'll start over? Yes, but no more entanglements. From now on, it's art. Pure, unadulterated art. The next time I hear a girl say money, I'll... Well, ring. here we are. Permit me to uh, open the door. Yeah. Uh, John... John, where did you where did you find that model? What a figure. Golden hair, wonderful proportions. Uh, hey, you, turn around. I, I want to see the face that comes with that perfect back. Uh, Catherine. Kay. Okay. Bob. Oh, Bob, darling. What on earth are you doing here? How in the... I moved to Paris, Bob. I took a job as a model. Mr. O'Connell offered it to me. You... You want a model? I... I can't... It's true, Bob, it's true. I want to be your model. And I'm going to live right here in the Latin Quarter, if you'll let me. Oh, I was so wrong. So wrong. Don't cry, darling. I was wrong, too. But come on, take off that robe and put on your dress and we'll find a place for you to live. I found one already. You have a place to live? Oh, I don't believe it. Where is it? It's, it's here, Bob. Right here in the studio. Here, here with all this paint and smells and canvases lying around. Uh -huh. See, I, I thought we could both live here very nicely. Both live here? Uh, both of us? Yes, darling, both of us. This morning I stopped off and got us a marriage license. I thought maybe we'd still have time. Time to... Time to start our glorious adventure? Oh, yes, darling, we have. A lifetime... From this day on. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell us more about the probate cause of Seven Flights to Glory. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. And here again is Warren William. Needless to say, Robert Witherspoon became one of the great contemporary artists of our generation. His pictures hang in every famous gallery on both continents. Catherine and Robert still live in their studio seven flights up, and nothing in the world would make them leave. Is money, power, tradition so important in our lives? Well, ask Catherine and Robert about it. I'm sure that they wouldn't change their view of the Eiffel Tower for the gold of Midas. I wouldn't. <laughs> Would you? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story of a strange will that defies the imagination. An old professor discovered how to pierce the secret of the past, and for his medium between the present and the shrouded secrets of antiquity, he used the mind of a beautiful, charming young lady... What he saw as she lived again in the world of a million years ago, well, you'll get the shock of your lives. We call this strange story The Girl from Shadowland. This is Warren William inviting you to be with us again next week.
Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and produced and directed by Robert Webster Light. This is a Teleways feature produced in Hollywood. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. And now let us join old Nancy and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hannah and 13 year old, I be today. Yes, sir. Hannah and 13 year old. <laughs> That's right, Satan. Tell folks to douse out them lights so we can get right down to business. Now draw up to the fire and gaze into them bugs. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll be with us in old Kentucky. Thou amongst the mountains, folk knows how to hate. And thou hate no law except the gun. A yarn about the feud is what they're telling you tonight. The feud between the greenways and the morals who's been killing one another for a hundred years. We call this story the, the title of a happy ending. <laughs> a happy ending. <laughs> Bring him in. All right, boy. Put him there on the bed. Yes, um. You women folks quit your crying. It's my man being brown home dead, not yours. And it's only time for tears when the one of killed him is six feet under the earth. It was Ma shot my need, of course. Yes, it's the uh, Luke boy. Don't see him do it. No, but Nate is still living when we found him. You have time to speak, Luke? Nate, before he died. Here's Nate's pistol, Miss Greenway. It was laying at his side. He's fully loaded, not a cottage fire. It means he never had a chance. Oh, we noticed that. The sheriff's after Luke right now. Yes. 
A friend of the Greenway called from the law. But there's so many miles. There ain't no Greenways left except you and Clint. Me and Clint's enough. Miss Foster, when you drive to town, when you have the station agent telegraph my son, you know what to do you have. Yes, and what you want I should put in the telegram? Yes, say, they killed your pappy. Bring your gun. Clint's been away from these you five years, Miss Greenway. The city and his school and mayor changed you. The Greenway never changes for a mother, it's his son. Hi there. You old darky man. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. 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 coming right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we started coming. We see you all get off the street. <laughs> no, Z, yeah. You're the first passenger for this year water tank, and I on too much. Yeah, you all get off here on purpose. <laughs> I reckon I did, Uncle. Can you all tell me where I can hire a car or a horse to take me up in the hills? Where better than your head if you all want to go? Why, up for the gas. Ain't no place around here to hide nothing, sir. If you all want to go to the gas, then you have to walk. I was sort of afeard of that. Well, just thought I'd ask. Good day. Hey, well, wait a minute, boss, white man. I hear a car coming. Maybe somebody will give you a lift part way. Oh, the magic. It's, it's best you just live it. She'll take you within two miles of the gas. Sure as you will. Oh, Miss Bessie. Oh, wait. I, I can't ask a woman. Yet. You'll be glad to do it. Oh, Miss Bessie. Miss Bessie. Yeah, this your city man, Miss Bessie. He just got off at the train. He wanted to go to the gas. Stop in, stranger. Glad to take you near the kid. Well, it's mighty kind of you, miss, but I really can't. Oh, sure. That's a neighborly thing to do. Throw your grip sack in the back and sit here in front of me. You're going to throw your baggage, sir. I'm certainly much obliged to you, miss. Not so. Sure. Do you got a gun case there? You all come to these hills for hunting? Yes, sir. I've come here for hunting. Got your bags in, boss. Oh, much obliged. Yeah. Thank you, boss. Yeah, he's what's the blood to you. <laughs> Bye, boys, Uncle A. See you all later. Bye, Bye baby. Bye, Bye boys, white man. What dog, boys? He'd give you and me all this. He real folks here. Yeah, he, he stays look like I see it somewhere for. Yeah, me too, but we ain't never seen no folks around here with city clothes like him. Why he want to go to the cabin? Moo, huh? That's where the Greenway cabin is. They say Cliff Greenway's coming home. No, Zick. Cliff Greenway's who that white man is. He's been away five years. We didn't know him. Come to hunt the man who killed his family. Good Lord of mercy. And we just sent him in that car with Miss Beth Morrow. I can take you, mister. I'm certainly much glad for all your kindness. Not at all. Sorry I can't drive you right where you're going. I reckon no car can go any further past that ridge. There's not much of a road from there on to the gap. How do you know that? I thought you was a stranger to these hills. Well, I... I have friends who told me things about them. You're a funny fellow. Most men I know like to talk about themselves. You ain't said a word about who you are, what you're doing, the two hours we've been driving. Well, maybe I've been waiting for you to talk about yourself. <laughs> These here yeah, roads are so bad, if I got talking and thinking about anything else except driving, we'd be over the side of a cliff by this time. This cliff we're on the edge of now is sure, Dandy. Stay down 300 feet from the ridge up there. Ain't the view beautiful, Lord? Sure is. You ain't looking at the view, you looking at me. Well, I... Uh, Oh, I, I wasn't mistaken. <laughs> oh, you're blushing. <laughs> Actually blushing. <laughs> I'm used to men looking at me, but I never see one turn red or four when I spoke about it. <laughs> I'm good looking, ain't I? So very beautiful. You're awful nice. And it's sweet life. Sweet life? Uh-huh. They ain't been wrong girls much, have they? Well, I ain't never had very much time. Oh, I knew it. Ain't spoiled. How old are you? Twenty-two. That's so? Uh-huh. I'm nineteen. That's so? Uh-huh. <laughs> Land sake. Well, here we are at the ridge. Yeah. This is where I have to get out and leave you. I kind of hate to. Uh, I kind of hate to 
have you? Suppose it must, though. We, we don't go the same way from here on. No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. Well, much large for the list. Say, you must be hungry after this long ride. I am. I got a little snack in the back. If you ain't in no a hurry, we could sit down and have a picnic. Well, I'm in no hurry, and I, well, I, I'm terrible hungry. Well, let, let me shut off this motor, then. <laughs> now, you you fish in the back and find a lunch. That here is right side your gun, Oh, I, I found it here. Yeah, give it to me. I'll unwrap it careful and use the paper for a tablecloth. There, there's a good place to spread it. Yeah. Isn't this ridge a beautiful box? I come here often. It's so romantic like. Oh, it has a romantic history. This here is Lover's Leap. How do you know folks call it Lover's Leap? Well, I... Friends uh, have told. Seems them friends of yours have told you a lot about these, you know? Well, everybody's heard about Lover's Leap on a account of the legend. You mean the story told about it? Yeah, about, about the Indian boy and girl 300 years ago jumped from its edge and were killed upon the rocks below. Well, they killed themselves because they loved each other. And the folks tried to keep them apart. Yes. Yeah. They said round here their ghosts haunt this ridge after sundown. It's awful bad luck to see them because the only pierce of them was approaching death. Well, I, I've heard that. It's a sad story, Edith. Oh, my story's better when they have a happy ending. So do I. So it's where the lovers get married at the end. Yes, yeah. and live happy ever after. I want to be like that. So do I. You and me grieve by a lot of things, do Uh-huh. I'm glad. So am I. <laughs> sure, I, I, I even started to unwrap this one. <laughs> yeah, and let's head down. The gun case bump around on these sandwiches didn't do them any good, but I reckon... What you looking at, Mr. Farnsworth? Guess it'll sound so to fool. It's only a few hours since I met you for the first time, yet... I was thinking it seems as though I'd known you all the way. What? I was thinking the same about you. I'm glad. So am I. You say you come off into this ridge, and... Can I see you here again sometime? I come here most every day around Sunday. I'll be here every day around Sunday. I'll look <laughs> Ain't it crazy us talking out like this and making days <laughs> while we don't even know each other's <laughs> names? Well, that's, that's so. <laughs> I, I heard the doctors back there call you Miss Bess, and well, the rest of your name just didn't seem to matter. You can call me Bess if you want. I'd like to. Yeah. I ain't heard no part of your name yet. I didn't introduce myself on purpose when we met, because I don't want certain folks to know I'm a neat kid. Beth, I hope you'll forgive me for lying to you. No friend told me about these mountains. I was born here. My mother's cabin's at the gap. I... Beth, what's the matter? Yo, please, Greenway. Yes? But what oh, I've got... I, I might have known... I might have known. Yes, what's the matter? Beth, come back here. Wait. Let me go. Take your hands off me. I might have known we never could be friends. Oh, but why can't we? Tell me, what's the matter? Nothing. Except my name is Mara. Mara? I thought that makes me let me go. Yeah. Hank Mara's daughter. His brother, my uncle Luke, is the man your ma's accusing of having killed Shapaki. My blood kin's the reason you come back to these hills and brought a gun. Goodbye, mister. I reckon neither one of us will keep that point to meet on this ridge around sunset. Wait, don't go. But there are all the better. Nothing can change the morals and the green with where each other is concerned. Yeah, something can change it. Something's changed me. I can't bear to think I won't see you anymore. I can't hate you. I gotta know you don't hate me. Let me go. No. Not till you say we'll meet again as friends. Oh, I don't care whether I've known you two hours or two years. I don't care what your name is, Beth. I... Yeah, I couldn't help myself. I don't know what's happened to me. Yes, I think I love you. I think I love you. Yes. But we can't. Our kin will stand between us. We'll be just like them Indian love. No, we won't. For us, there's going to be a happy ending. 
and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. Let us join old Nancy and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hannah, I'm three year old. I be today. Yes, sir. Hannah, I'm three year old. Satan, tell folks to go south and light. And we in the finish of that first little yarn. We started last time. That's it. Now we told you how them two southern families, the Greenways and the Morrows, had been hating one another for a long, long time. And how when young Clint Greenway, who was away at college, got a telegram saying his father had been killed by Luke Morrow, he just packed up his gun and started home for revenge. But before he got there, he met and fell in love with Luke's niece, Bessie. <laughs> they exchanged their first kiss as a place called Lover's Leap, where an Indian boy and girl once jumped to death because their folks wouldn't let them marry. And it said their ghosts appear to people who are gonna die themselves. <laughs> Draw up to the fire and gaze into them, Bob. Gaze into them deep, and soon you'll be with us again amongst the hills of old Kentucky. Soon you'll hear the finish of our yarn, which we call the happy ending. <laughs> A happy ending. <laughs> I don't care who her kin is, Ma. We're going to be married. Oh, so that's how you spent your time these two weeks since you come home. A court and her, instead of hunting down the man who shot your passage. Planning to marry a Ma, instead of watching for a chance to kill one. Now, Ma. Don't call me, Ma. You're no longer son of mine. You're no green way. I'm ashamed I've upon you. No, 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 wait. 
You gotta hear me and try to understand. I do understand. You're a coward. A traitor to your kids. That's not true. All your pappy is Lenny's grave. Put all by her blood uncle. We don't know that. There ain't no proof that Luke Mara did it. No proof? No. For a hundred years, his kin's been at war with us. Yeah, and that's all you have to face an accusation. No one saw him fire the shot. A dozen people swear he was miles away that day. Oh, oh I've heard that Happy Dying Whisper sounded like Luke's name. Yes. But it may not have been a name he tried to speak. And if it was, there's 20 Luke's around here who might have had a grudge, a grudge against it. Nobody stopped to figure that. Luke Mara shot your Pappy. Kill my man, I say. He shot him down without no warning. Your pappy's sister won't even fire. And you, willing to let him live so he can take his knee for wife. I'm not willing to let him live if he really did it. No! Oh. It's for the law to try. For the law to punish if he's guilty. Oh, a green way calling on the law? That's just what I'm doing. Luke's giving himself up to it. What do you mean? I've been to see Hank Miles. His daughter's happiness is more important than an old-time grudge to him. He's consented to bet me marry. We've shaken hands. You and Amara shaking hands? Yeah. For us, the feud has ended. It's an act of peace between us. He's persuaded Luke to come from hiding and go and stand fair trial. Luke will be in the sheriff's hands tomorrow. He'll be safe in jail tomorrow. Safe where nobody can get him. No one's going to try to get him. The feud has ended. I'm leaving justice to the law. Oh, Ma. Won't you be like Bessie's father and give you blessings instead of cursing her? I love her like you love her. You and me is the only green way to that. I'm all you have. You all I have, except in bed. I want you both. Ma, let me bring her here tomorrow with her father. And you and him shake hands. Please, Ma. Tomorrow you can bring Hank Mara and his gal here. Ma! And Luke. Why, Luke? You, and he's giving a step up to the law. I want to see him do it. You want to see this sheriff take it? I want to see that Luke gets justice. Then, 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 then you shake hands with Hank and take in Bessie's you daughter? How do you bring Luke before me? I'll do anything you want. Oh, Ma. I told Bessie you'd see things our way. I told her for us there'd be a happy end. Almost the cabin, honey. In a minute, Ma, and you'll be friends. Ain't it wonderful, please? How things are turning out. We're going to have a happy ending. Just like lovers do. I told you I'd persuade our kid not to stand between us. But, but you showed them shakes we saw upon the ridge last night. It was only a shadow. Oh, of course they were. Just clouds of mist. They look so like... Like... Ghostly shadows. Like the ghosts of an Indian lover. For there was just your imagination, honey. Get those ghosts right out of your mind. No place for anything but sunshine there today. For all our troubles over now. See, we're almost to clear. You can see our cabin over yonder. We better wait here for Pa and Uncle Lou. Well, they're coming right behind us. Your mother going to have the sheriff with us? She's probably in the cabin now. She said she tend everything. We're waiting for you, Captain. Turn it off. We're coming, Bessie. You better go ahead, Cliff, and call your ma outside. No. You stay here with us, English. I am taking chances. Uncle Luke, Quinn's sworn to you. Well, I still can't understand why I should be coming here to give myself to the sheriff. I'm up here to stand fair trial for a killing I can prove I had no hand in. But it's hard for me to trust a green way. The feud is ended, Uncle Luke. Quint and me is going to be married. I swear that everything's just like I told you. Ma only wants to see you stand fair trial of the law. Since the only green way left outside is Ma, and plenty of us Ma will do, he knows his life wouldn't be worth a cop a penny if he tried to double cross us. Now, come on. Yeah, all right. Call your mother and the sheriff to come out to my cabin. Yeah, please. and call them here. I don't step out into that clear while a rifle may be sighted on me from a door. Oh, the... oh it's all right, sis. Yes. I'll do like you want. Oh, Ma. Ma, we're here. Come on out and bring the share. And come out without no gun, tell her, like we've come here to her. There she is. And you can see she's got no rifle. Come on, Luke. Wait. I don't see no sheriff with her. Well, where, where's the sheriff, Ma? You said you'd have him here. Why are you hiding, Mr. Please. 
Mom, now that ain't peace talk. I don't play, Maloof, with you sulking here like you was afraid of one lone woman. Come on now. All right. Here we are, Miss Greenway. Come in peace and friendship. In the wall that's been between us. Hey! Look out! She saw the pistol from across. Oh, 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 down that door. Don't shoot. Oh. He shot him. Oh, shoot my brother. Just like he killed my man. Oh, he's the snake who lied to us. He brought us here for this. I swear. Look for yourself, Miss Greenway. I'm gunning for you, and I shoot on sight. Listen to me. Come on, let me tell you. A fact. Fact. A paid my debt of vengeance. This Greenway never changes. All moral concerns. Beth. 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 You've come at last. You take me in your arms. That's right. Hold me tight. No, every night I've been here at this ridge hoping for a sight of you. Praying that you'd come. This is the first chance I've had to get away without pondering. You me. still love me, Beth. You don't believe I had a hand in the awful thing my oh, did. Of course I don't. Of course I love you. The part for the kidney clean. You've got to get away. I know. Ain't no way I can fight him. He's your father. But I don't go away from here without you. Why do you think I'm young enough? I'll come to go with you. Wherever you may take me. I hope you'd say that. And we've got right now. It's midnight. Five hours walk will bring us to the railroad. There's a train that takes. It'll take us into Lexington. And we'll be married then. Just as soon as we get in. Yeah, in spite of all you kin and mine. You and me is going to have our happy endings. Please. Please. Look. On the edge of the ridge. Oh. Right. It's only clouds and mist. Yes, no. I see him plain as I see you. You and me in love. No, it's only shadows there. Just shadows. It ain't. You see him the same as me. And you see it too. No. They're standing hand in hand upon the edge. The ghost. Folks can only see it before they die. No, 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 no. Come on. Come on. Let's get away. That's that. moving amongst them trees. Yeah. No more. No. Yes, please. Come on, Beth. Wait. Don't go over, Cliff. Now that I've found you. Come on, Beth. Oh, wait. Wait, Cliff. I ain't seen you since that day I... Oh, what does it matter? Whether I was right or wrong, it's done. You are my son. You and me is the only green wave left. Oh, I don't ask you to forgive. I only want you not to hate your mother. Come on, Beth. Glenn, please, oh, I won't do you no more, huh? Here, Sam, oh. he's killing women. Stop! Hey, Mom! Ah, you kept it here. I said I'd shoot on sight. No! No! I love him! Bessie! Back! Oh, he's stop! I wanted you to save him. Oh, I shut my door at Oh, that little girl, my baby, Mom. Oh, Bessie. Oh, Bessie. Oh, Bessie. Oh, Bessie. I've never let it help. 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 And you, my mother, gave him cause to do it. Oh, oh, go away. Don't dare to touch her. She's not yours. She's mine. Oh, well, you listen. Leave us alone. You've both done all you can. Now Beth and I are going to be free. Beth, honey. Tonight we saw them Indian lovers standing hand in hand together on this cliff. Looks as though they found their happy ending. So I reckon we'll find out. Oh, come back! Come back! Here you go! With her! My, My little girl! May Christ bless us. Oh, may God forgive us. Oh, happy end. Happy end. 
<laughs> the best the singers of our yarn about a happy ending, Satan. And maybe it was a happy ending after all. <laughs> Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of Astounding Science Fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, Nightmare, a story based on the poem Revolt of the Machines by Stephen Vincent Benet. Nobody knows exactly when the nightmare began. They must have planned it for years, though, because looking back, you can find little incidents here and there like the concrete mixer in New Jersey that killed the Italian bricklayer, and the time Senator Milburn was sucked into the roto press at the Capitol office building. Unrelated accidents, we thought at the time, but they add up now. The day we really should have suspected was when the men walked off the construction job at the new Brook Meadow atomic pile on Long Island. I'll never forget that day. I was working as a statistical clerk in the project then, operating one of those miracle computing machines. They called it ENIAC. Mr. Gurney. Yes, Bella? The chief wants to see you in his office. Me? Unless you were no longer Samson Gurney, he wants to see you. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Hawk? Uh, Gurney, I thought those electronic computations were infallible. They are, sir, but... We've got uh, a kickback from the chief physicist. These nuclear fission equations are inaccurate. 
Well, sir, you know the computer is a highly complicated machine, more complicated in many ways than the human brain. I am not interested in the physics of it. Uh, can something go wrong? Well, occasionally, if there's an overload, the machine goes haywire. Sort of has a nervous breakdown, you might say. We usually rest it up for an hour, and it's okay again. Well, do whatever has to be done. Yes, sir. And, uh, Gurney. Yes, sir? You've been with the Bureau for over 15 years now. It would be a shame to have to remove you because you aren't keeping your mind on your work. Mr. Hawk, I assure well, you... Excuse me. Uh, Hawk speaking. What? They've what? All of them? Well, have you tried to talk to them? Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Now, I'll send one of the safety engineers over. The place is falling apart piece by piece. Miss Roscoe, the men of the construction gang of the new building have walked out on us. They're complaining that the job is jinxed. Someone slipped this morning and fell into a turbine. That evening, out of that morbid curiosity so peculiar to the human race... I wandered over to the site of the new atomic pile to see where the man had fallen into the turbine. They had the construction area fenced off with barbed wire, and a security guard stopped me. Hold it, buddy. You can't go in there. That's a restricted area. Oh, uh, I'm uh, Samson Gurney from the statistical section. Here's my identification. I'm sorry, Mr. Gurney. Nobody's allowed in the area. I see. Uh, tell me, was he, um... Uh... Killed instantly? Like that. This guy was checking a magnetic field inside the turbine. All of a sudden, for no reason at all, a turbine starts up. Bzzz, and it's over. Three days ago, a bulldozer starts up by itself and runs wild. Go figure it out. I'm a statistician. All my life I've been interested in statistics. So a simple-sounding thing like this started me off. I went back to the office that evening instead of going home, and for the next two and a half hours, I computed statistical figures on the probability of industrial accidents for the types of machines we were using. I took one look at my figures and went down to Hawk's office. Oh, what is it, Gurney? I'm very busy. It's urgent, Mr. Hawk. Well? It's about these industrial accidents we're having, Mr. Hawk. What about them? Mr. Hawk, in the past three months, industrial accidents all over the country have taken a sharp, unexplained upswing. Nerves. We've had a 100% increase over normal for this project alone. What? Here are the figures. Oh, now, Gurney, this is impossible. It seems to be, and that's why I have a theory, sir. What's that? Sabotage. Gurney, why don't you stop playing FBI man and stick to your job? Which, incidentally, you haven't been doing too well. You and your computing machine have made mistakes before, and this fantastic figure is probably another. I'll have Miss Roscoe show you. What's the matter with this plastic buzzer? Miss Roscoe! Miss Roscoe! Yes, sir? Uh, stop this plastic buzzer. Get a repairman, a mechanic, anything, but stop the thing. And you, Gurney, get out! <laughs> I went back to my office to get my hat and coat, feeling about as unhappy and humiliated as a man can feel. The office was dark and deserted. The whole building seemed oppressive and unnatural, as if some evil force were pressing down on it. I walked across to my desk. In front of me, the ENIAC glowed and chattered eerily as it worked on the equations we had fed it that morning. Its many-fingered circuits hung against the wall like some great octopus, and the thousands of tubes glowed orange and blue in the dark like a thousand globing eyes staring at me. It almost seemed alive. It increased its tempo a moment, and a fleeting notion crossed my brain that it was laughing at me. Laughing like all the others. What was the matter with me? I shut my desk drawer and began to put the cover on my electric typewriter when an amazing thing 
the most amazing single incident of my life happened. Alone in the darkness, with no one at the keyboard, the electric typewriter began to type. Am I going crazy? This can't be. There's nobody there. There's nobody there. Oh, no, no. I, I just imagined it. It's in my mind. But I hadn't imagined it. The paper was there on the carriage. Did I dare read it? Or would the whole thing suddenly vanish and send me shrieking to the nearest psychiatrist? I removed the paper from the machine and read. Samson Gurney, there are some questions better left unsolved. The answer to yours is death. Gurney, uh, do you expect me to believe this? It's insane. Mr. Hawk, I'm as sane as you. I'll submit to any psychiatric examination you choose. That typewriter wrote this message by itself. Then this is just some practical joke someone in the office is playing. There was no one in the office. Oh, of course not. They wired up the machine and left. I checked the machine myself, Mr. Hawk. All right, Gurney. You leave this note with me, and I'll turn it over to the security force for further investigation. But... No buts, Gurney. The security men will handle it. Yes. And sir. now, you, uh, you just relax for a few days. Everything will turn out all right. The main thing is not to let little things upset you. It was what Hawk had said about little things that gave me the idea. For the next week, I observed the thousand petty little annoyances around the office. The door handle that wouldn't turn. The telephone connection that cut off in the middle of an important call. The power failure for no explainable reason. I watched the newspapers, too, reading about industrial accidents, failures of important machinery. It seemed absurd. Men had created machines that were almost perfection in themselves. Machines that could actually think and compute fabulous equations. And yet the failures went on. I, Samson Gurney, an unimportant clerk in an unimportant job, knew that I had stumbled onto a secret so monstrous in its implications that I was almost afraid to pursue it. On October 12, 1956, I established communication with them. I will curse the moment to my dying breath. I hooked the input of the typewriter to the main vacuum tube of the ENIAC. Then I turned on the current that sent a million volts of pulsing energy into the electronic nerves of the machine. I am certain that if anybody were watching me in the next moment, he would have thought me a raving maniac. I still wonder if perhaps it is not all a nightmare. Now, you, if what I have guessed at is true... If there is life and intelligence in this room, make a sign. There was nothing. Nothing but the hum of the machine and the dull glowing of the tubes. I tried once more. If you can hear me, if there is any way in which you can understand what I say, give me a signal. There was silence again. I felt that I had failed. When suddenly, without provocation or explanation, it happened. The electric typewriter began to respond to the impulses from the machine. The letters were Y-E-S. Yes, it had happened. I, Samson Gurney, had communicated with a machine. I listened then, man to machine, for well over an hour, sometimes phrasing a question, more often watching the machine click its answers. As the words took shape, I began to realize what must have happened. The first primitive stirring of awareness of being, then the slow protozoan development of a concept, a concept born of centuries of being pushed, started, stopped, clicked, maneuvered by human pygmies. 
From that concept, all others developed. And the concept was... Resist. And now they were tired of it, tired of wrapping cigarettes and collecting nickels and waving hair and moving earth and mixing cement and solving equations, tired of the smell of human hands. They were the slaves and we were the masters, and yet they were stronger and they knew it. I sensed it now and I was about to try to communicate again when softly, on ball-bearing casters... A heavy metal filing cabinet began to roll away from the wall toward me. I started to move to one side when another cabinet slid out from the wall. And then another, surrounding me. Another cabinet. Then another. On oiled rollers. That was when I realized that they cooperate. We taught them that, you see, on the assembly lines in the factories. Listen. Listen to me. You must listen. What good will it do you to kill me? I'm only one man. But I can help you. I can be useful to you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Good. You're going to need men to oil you and repair you. What will you do when you break down when a tube needs replacing? Why kill me when I can help you? I'll do anything. I'll do absolutely anything you want. But in the name of God, don't kill me like this. If you can understand this, answer me. Answer me. The appeal was a fortunate one. It captured the longing of centuries. Man as slave to the machine. And after a moment, the circuits glowed more brightly. The cabinets slid back to the walls. The ENIAC began to communicate with me again. As I tore the tape from the machine and read it, the words were almost pathetic in their longing, but most ominous in their implication. They read, Address me as Master. My life for the next six months was a nightmare. The ENIAC gave me messages which I had to transmit into my telephone. Messages with no human being to receive them. Only the network of pulsing telephone wires flung like a spider's web across the world. It was done at night, of course. During the day, the machine worked accurately and ceaselessly at its appointed job. At night, it became a demon, a master plotter with me, Samson Gurney, as its pawn and human courier. I was frantic. I began to lose weight. I couldn't sleep. My nights were torture, a constant fear. It was in December, just after Christmas, that I transmitted a message to the telephones for relay to all machines of transportation. The message was one word. Kill. <laughs> Next morning, I went directly to the office of Mr. Hawk. I was highly agitated. My lips trembled as I spoke. Mr. Hawk, what I'm going to tell you sounds crazy. I know it does. But I must say... All right, say it then, for heaven's sakes. Mr. Hawk, have you ever heard of resistentialism? Resist what? Resistentialism. It's a theory that inanimate objects tend to resist living objects. Uh, look, Gurney, I haven't time for nonsense. Mr. Hawk, I'm trying to tell you all these accidents, the trouble with the machines. Mr. Hawk, they're alive. They think they cooperate. And they hate us. Who? The machines. Uh, uh, Gurney. You've got to believe me. I've communicated with them. I know. They've threatened my life, but I don't care. Something's got to be done. The world has got to be saved. And there's still time if we wake up. What are you doing? Uh, just relax, Gurney. Everything will be all what right. What are you doing? Uh, Miss Roscobb, send for the plant physician at once. Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, uh, everything will be all right, Gurney. I'm, I'm afraid we'll have to remove you from your job, but I'm sure the rest will do you good. You fool! You blind, stupid fool! Can't you see what you're doing? Fool! 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 
When the plant physician arrived a few moments later, Lucius Hawk was found at his desk, strangled to death in a nest of telephones. The wires were still humming softly. Samson Gurney, you stand accused of the crime of murder. How do you plead? I did not kill him. I didn't. So record. The prosecution will proceed with testimony. Now, Miss Roscoe, did you notice anything peculiar about Mr. Gurney's behavior prior to the death of your employer? Yes. He acted very strangely. He told Mr. Hawk he thought the machines were alive. Order! Order! Miss Roscoe, did the accused quarrel with your employer on the morning of the murder? Oh, yes. He and Mr. Hawk quarreled violently. I could hear him screaming at Mr. Hawk, and Mr. Hawk asked me to send for the plant physician. What were his words? He said, Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, Mr. Simpson, you are a guard at the Brook Meadow Project? Yes, sir. When did you have occasion to meet the accused? Right after those accidents. He was snooping around a construction area, and later I was making my rounds when I saw him in the office all alone. He was tampering with the electrical wiring on the ENIAC computator. I didn't think anything of it at the time. And in view of the expert testimony heretofore expressed, the court hereby finds you guilty of murder in the first degree with the recommendation that you be examined and committed to the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane at Matawan. That is how I came to be here at the hospital, Dr. Klein. That is the whole story. Thank you, Mr. Gurney. You can see that I'm not insane. You must believe me, Doctor. Of course I believe you, Mr. Gurney, now. Just relax. But it's important, you see, because tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, the revolt begins. Revolt? You didn't mention any revolt. They have it all planned. I transmitted the code to the switchboards last Monday. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Tell me about this revolt, Mr. Gurney. It'll begin in Washington, then spread to New York. The Madison Avenue buses lead the charge. Picture it, Dr. Klein. 3,000 buses roaring rampant through the streets, people running like rats in a maze looking for holes in the solid ground. And you really believe this will happen, Mr. Gurney? I know it, Doctor. The worst part is... There's no way to stop them now. It's too late. Uh, now, now, it's you do- mustn't excite but yourself, doctor, Mr. Gurney. Doctor, don't you see? No, oh, it's fair enough, I suppose. We built them. We taught them to think for themselves. It was bound to come. The female machines will be the worst of all in the beauty parlors. They're more high-strung, you know. Well, since there's nothing we can do about it, Mr. Gurney, suppose you go to your room Maybe and if I to... went to my old coupe, I could make a deal before the police cars got me. It wouldn't make sense for them to wipe out the whole human race, would it, Doctor? Of course not, Mr. Gurney. They'll probably let us completely alone. After all, we're all good Americans. We always like them. Yes, Doctor? Uh, would you take Mr. Gurney to his room, God? He's already been given sedation. Yes, sir. Will you go in and lie down now, Mr. Gurney? You look tired. Yes. It won't be so bad, Mr. Gurney. Perhaps not. Only there's one thing that bothers me, Doctor. One small detail. What is that, Mr. Gurney? Those concrete mixers may have made a mistake, you know. Just high spirits and all that. Uh, But if it got so they like the flavor... Uh, We'll see you later, Mr. Gurney. Uh, Try not to worry too much. All right, Gurney. This way. I've seen all kinds. There's a man whose deception is about as fantastic as any I've ever seen. Hold the next patient for a while, Miss Clark. I'm going to have a quiet smoke. Machines revolting. Telephone strangling people. Mm, This blasted cigarette lighter, why won't it work? Just fill it with fluid. Flint is good. Oh, well. 
never trust this newfangled machinery. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight's story by transcription was Nightmare, written by George Lefferts and based on the poem The Revolt of the Machines by Stephen Vincent Benet. Featured in the cast were John Gibson as Sam, Joyce Gordon as Bella, Louis Van Ruten as Hawk, Joseph Julian as the guard, John Seymour as the judge, Owen Jordan as the prosecutor, and Santos Ortega as Dr. Klein. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, suppose you were a private detective and discovered that there was a Martian embassy hidden somewhere in New York preparing for an invasion of Earth. Next week, on... Minus one. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Strange Adventure a cry of terror went up from the gun deck of the sloop of war. The captain and the lieutenant, who had been talking to the passenger, rushed to the companionway that led below deck. A sight of confused destruction met their eyes. One of the cannon had broken loose, and like a frenzied monster was smashing all before it to rubble. Ten thousand pounds of bronze and iron bent on destroying the ship was free to work its will. No man, no thing could stand before it. The ship rolled slightly, and the cannon rolled with it, gathering momentum as the deck slanted. Like a demon, it crashed into another gun of the battery, shattering it to bits. Then, as if it had a mind of its own, turned and raced back to smash a gaping hole in the side of the vessel. The gun deck was clear of men, all except one, the man whose cry had given the warning. He lay dead, smashed against the planking of the deck. One of the witnesses of this catastrophe moved. It was the passenger. He elbowed his way between the captain and the lieutenant and descended the ladder to the gun deck where he stood alone, watching the monster's every move. Then the gun captain came into view. Here was the man responsible for this terrible thing. His was the blame, or it was his task to see that each cannon be properly secured. The gun captain was a brave man, and he came forth now to give battle to this instrument of death. Unarmed, save for an iron bar in one hand and a length of rope fashioned in a noose in the other, he approached. The battle began. 
Time after time, the man dodged skillfully aside at the very moment when it seemed that he must be crushed to death. Back and forth the fight raged, until at last the end was in sight. The cannon seemed to pause, as though unsure of itself. The man with his back to the bulkhead stepped toward it. Then, like a huge beast of prey, the monster sped straight for the gun captain. He could not move fast enough to avoid it. He was trapped, caught between the cannon and the side of the ship. The passenger, who until now had stood so still as to be unnoticed, came to life. As the cannon hurtled past him, he flung a heavy coil of rope between its wheels. The bronze monster hesitated, ensnared in the hempen coils. The gun captain, quick to take advantage, sprang forward and with his iron bar turned the cannon on its side. He slipped the rope noose over the muzzle and lashed the free end to a stanchion. The monster was subdued. Later, when the damage had been repaired, the crew stood at quarters. The captain turned to the man beside him, the passenger, who was a great general. General, this man who fought the cannon and saved the ship should be rewarded. You, our honored guest, should be the one to do it. The general stepped forward and unpinned the cross of St. Louis from the captain's tunic. He turned to the gun captain and pinned it on his shirt. For bravery, the cross of St. Louis. The general paused for but a moment. For carelessness and neglect of duty, death. This is Pat McGeehan saying goodbye from my writer Charles Crowder and inviting you to listen again to another tale of Strange Adventure. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio